Well, first off, I want to say thanks a lot for coming on here. I, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedule to to come on. Um, you you have, were uh, you've always been one of those guys that were was I think integral in kind of um, propelling the tech P career field to kind of the next level. You know, you came in, um, <clears throat> and we'll get to it in a minute. But I remember you came in as 18th ASOG commander, and it was everybody was like, "Wow, how's this going to work?" It's a CCT guy, but he's a right you know, he's going to be our commander and it was kind of, everybody was kind of apprehensive and I, I think it worked out well. I think, I thought it was, um, n not just, not any disparaging against anybody that came before you or after or anything, but it was kind of a mix up, a shake up that I, I think kind of worked out for us. You know, I think it was beneficial by, by every, every, uh, stretch, you know? So, um, I just want to say thanks again for coming on and what you've done for the career field. I think it's awesome. Um, how, how you been? I, I haven't seen it. Like it's been a while. So, uh, how's things going? Well, you know, uh, we all, we all, uh, progress in our phases of, uh, of life. And I'm in the, uh, probably the, I'm still, I'm at the end of now my contractor phase where, you know, government service for, uh, 35 years. And then, uh, what do you do after that? Uh, because you haven't really grown up yet. Uh, <laughs> and people ask you, um, are you retired or are you not? Well, of course, you're, you're not really going to be retired, retired, but you want a kind of a lifestyle that, that matches that. And, um, because I wanted to keep eating and feeding my family, I decided to, that I would be a contractor and do the kinds of things that, you know, I love doing. Uh, so for a while, I was helping cities and counties uh, in their city management and county management, um, you, you know, safety kind of advisor, um, program advisor, those kinds of things. Um, and I liked it uh, because a lot of good people that are serving our cities and our counties and our small towns and out there because, you know, all politics are local and right. local people are really running the government where they live. I like that because it is, it is Americana, if you will. And all communities are a little different. Uh, they're not all exactly the same, but they all have exactly. the same. We need to take care of the citizens that live here and the people who vote and the people who pay taxes. And so I liked working with cities and counties, but you know, my love is for uh, national security and uh, military stuff. So I came back and Pete Donnelly offered me a position at Lidos uh, as a contractor. And so I've been doing that since 2016, uh, basically, and oh, trying wow. to help, you know, our, our business, the air ground business, if you will, uh, for the Air Force. Right. Um, and we've had some struggles programming wise. Our business is going to take a pretty big cut here uh, in manpower. I'm concerned about that uh, because I was yeah. trying to grow it. <laughs> you know, now we're in this period where we're reducing that uh, force structure. And of course, I don't want to be a doomsday person, but I go, well, uh, we do that at risk. And I mean, the government does that at risk because you just right. can't create, you know, JTACs. Attack P force structure. You can't create just like a soft force structure. You can't create that overnight. And so when you get rid of it or a part of it, even if you realize that you've made a mistake, it takes you a while to fix the mistake. It you because right. you can't get there overnight. You can't have great people, um, then cut half of them out, and then expect that you can just snap your fingers and. Uh, great people will appear again. Now we have a little head start because we've done some of this before, but it's still painful. So I feel it. Sure. I, I feel the pain because I see it um, and because I've gone through it before, but I'm still worried about yeah. the business. I'm, more, I'm worried about the great people that are in the business and um, who are great American heroes in my mind. And uh, we'll talk about many, many of them in my pitch because they made my career. In other words, without them, the combat control, special tactics, TACP, 
battlefield weather or strategic reconnaissance. Without those folks, uh, Mike Longoria doesn't have a career. I mean, it's <laughs> right. that, that if you know what I mean, that it just without without all those great folks, um, uh, I actually probably would have had no purpose <laughs> in in the Air Force. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, so that, um, that that's what I've been doing, if you will, for the last um, ten years. Uh, okay. Basically. Yeah, you sent. Uh, I I was just reading up on you, and um, I I want to just cover some things first before we get into your military career, because what you've done since you've gotten out, and, and some things you you did, but non-military type stuff, that just, was just amazing. Like for instance, you had you have three master's degrees: air power, art, and science. National Security and Strategic Studies and Public Communications. Then you got your bachelor's in political science. Um, you've been an author and a contributor to several books, peer-reviewed articles, publications. Um, you were asked to write several conference papers and conduct several presentations and lectures and senior executive fellow to the JFK uh, um, School of Government at Harvard, which is, <laughs> that's crazy, that's amazing. Um, senior visiting fellow and special uh, policy analyst for the Congressional Research Service for Foreign Affairs. International Trade and Technology at the Library of Congress. I mean, we're talking about like, <clears throat> like high, like national level things, like seriously high level things uh, that are is just amazing. Um, some other things that I was in, that really was interesting to me. Um, Special Analytical Service to the Federal Government. You were National Academics and Science and Engineering, uh, Defense Advanced Research uh, Projects Agency, as we know, is DARPA, um, Developmental Labs Incorporated, and then. The, what was really kind of encompasses my view of you is you, like your memberships, like your um, international city and county um, management association, which is kind of what you're talking about as far as like the, the local level right. um, government type stuff, the, where it all kind of happens, where, where, where real government matters at that level. Um, Colorado, Texas Municipal Leagues, U.S. Hispanic Leadership Institute, Harvard Executive Fellows, Alumni, um, American Red Cross, Special Operations Forces, Warrior Foundation, Air Commando Association, and last but certainly not least, the TACP Association, which I think is a testament to your uh, dedication to, like you were saying, like all battlefield airmen, but also you had that, you you touched the TACP career field in a way that was like, you haven't forgotten it. You know, you kind of stuck with us and, and I really appreciate that stuff. So that's, in a nutshell, that's some stuff you've done since you've been out, um, what, which is amazing. But I, also the other things I'd like to talk on were the things you did when you were in. I mean, just... And I think a lot of us know you as, you know, the boss and the general or the colonel or uh, in those regard. But um, I'm really interested in, you know, early guy, the early, you know, like Lieutenant Longoria and that, that kind of thing. So if you want to if you could um, take us back to what got you into the military in the first place and then maybe take us through like, um, uh, you know, like Panama and Desert Storm, Desert Shield, that kind of thing and just kind of let us kind of figure out where you were, where you started and give us a better picture of like, you know, where you came from, that kind of thing. Sure. I'd be happy to. So there is a, over the last five to six years in our society, we've come up with this weird term, uh, privilege, uh, you know, who has privilege, who doesn't have privilege, et, et, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, I don't want to get right. uh, a political. Uh, because if you were to ask me the question, was I born with privilege? Did I have privilege? My answer would be absolutely. I had more privilege than than you can possibly describe. I, I don't feel guilty about it because it, it it is what it is. So my parents were 17 and 18 when they had me. <laughs> they were um, very good students in, um, in Houston, Texas. They both went to San Jacinto High School where they met each other and apparently were very attracted to each other. <laughs> and um, my mom was a very, very uh, white Scotch Irish uh, background, um, uh, very Methodist. Uh, my father was a very, very dark uh, Mexican uh, Catholic uh, person. Um, and those were my parents. 
Uh, and so if you ask me, do, do I have privilege? I guarantee you I had privilege because of my parents. Yeah. Um, and they were teenagers when they had me. I cannot imagine right. having uh, all the children that I've had. Uh, I can't imagine having them when I was a teenager. Like it, it, no. it, 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 it's unbelievable. They have remained, right. uh, they've both passed away, but they have remained the smartest, wisest people that I've ever known. And so when people you know, who did you follow and who who were the great leaders in your in your life, et cetera, et cetera. And, and there are a bunch. But number one were my parents um, who did everything in the world for me that you could possibly um, possibly do. Um, you know, they didn't have much money, but uh, they bought me an encyclo uh, an entire encyclopedia. When I was four years old, of course, I couldn't read it then. I was, uh, you know, but but I grew up with an entire encyclopedia in my room. Uh, I mean, what kid gets that? Um, so let's just say I was born, in my view, uh, with privilege. I had great grandparents, uh, wonderful grandparents that were probably making that cultural shift. I don't know if there was any kind of racism or or bias against Mexicans or I, I have no idea. I never saw it okay. growing up. And so I feel privileged to have grown up uh, the way I did. And that was in Houston, Texas, sure. uh, had great schools, great teachers and great coaches. Um, and. That's why when I, I, I feel guilty of the way some people talk about privilege, because I go, yeah, I I have privilege. I, I had huh. uh, because of my parents, mostly. And all the right. coaches and teachers um, that that helped get me into the military. And most of my teachers, arguably, um, were amazed that I wanted to go into the military. They had oh, other really? plans for me, you know. Uh, you okay. could be a lawyer. I don't. I don't think I could have been a lawyer because, or you know, a doctor or anything. I'm really, I, to be honest with you, I have privilege, but I'm not that smart. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's my uh, assessment. Cause I've been around a lot of smart people, but I don't consider myself, you know, all that, uh, uh, all that smart. But it is helpful. When you grow up with a lot of smart people around you, oh, um, sure. it's it's very helpful. That's why I feel uh, privileged in in that regard. So um, uh, I I think I, I like I like how humble you are, but obviously you're you're very smart. So, uh, but yeah, this is but this is a testament to you and how you are, and you're just you're such a humble guy that you know uh, you have a lot of humility and you you are very appreciative of the guys around you. But well, no, I appreciate it. Uh, I did have. Um, some particular teachers, uh, one uh, biology teacher that knew that this is what I, I wanted to do, uh, make it to the Air Force Academy. And so um, they uh, I had teachers helping me, you know, to, helping me determine, uh, you know, what, you know, I tried to take all of the math that I could in high school, you know, uh, mm -hmm. up through, you know, what at the time was. Um, analytic geometry and calculus one and two and I, I want because for the academy that that helps you if you will to have that kind of um math mathematics as a background uh they care about the other part too but the, the the math background is very helpful and so i went yeah and i i'm not saying i was good at it i'm just saying i liked it i mean i, I liked math and, and and understood all of that uh so okay. Uh, they helped me. And then in high school, I was most mostly an athlete. Uh, so I played football, uh, basketball, nice. baseball, ran track and cross country. So, okay. and, and I, I loved it. Matter, matter of fact, when I look back at high school, I have to tell you that um, it, it was fun. I, I, I loved, I, I loved high school almost as much as being 
a brand new combat control officer uh, in the military as a second lieutenant at Holbrook <laughs> Field. Uh, high school was that fun for me. And um, nice. I had a great high school. I had great teammates on my football team. I had the two, I was the quarterback for the, for the team. And uh, we had done very well. I had the two best running backs. I had great wide receivers. Uh, and um, a lot of the players from that team went on to play pros. And it's not often in really? high school, because it was Texas football. So, you know, Texas oh, yeah, high school yeah. football is a, is, is a little uh, different. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a big yeah, deal yeah. In, in the state yeah, yeah. of Texas. And um, one of my best friends of all time is a, is a lawyer now in Houston. And he was an All-American uh, linebacker at Dartmouth. Uh, so, you know, when okay. I was at the Air Force Academy, he was becoming an all-american at dartmouth and um wow. uh another one of the line was um played for the new york jets and we had um, someone that played for the cleveland uh browns uh the old huh. cleveland Browns, not the new yeah. cleveland browns the cleveland browns that became the baltimore ravens the the, the that old oh, right. cleveland browns before they were the ravens so oh, okay so i feel um uh, I mean, I loved it. I was the um, the governor for the Texas Oklahoma District of Key Clubs, so that's about four hundred and fifty key clubs in Oklahoma and Texas. And so after wow. the football season, I literally was traveling every weekend to some uh, town in Texas or Oklahoma uh, to to speak at a key club, and that. That literally changed. Uh, I would say changed my. It. It changed everything uh, that I know because you met a lot of Kiwanians uh, that were really good. And, you know, it's a service club, and I loved it. Right. Uh, all. That's why a lot of my teachers thought that I would be good at law. I should go to the University of Texas and go to the University of Texas Law School, and then become a politician. But they really didn't know me well enough. I, while I loved that, um, I was a guy destined to go into the military. I, I don't know yeah. who it was because it's it's what I wanted to do. Um, now, I really wanted to be a yeah. pilot, but uh, I had a really bad car accident my senior year at the Air Force Academy. And um, Oh, really? Yeah, it was uh, pretty bad. So... I had about 470 stitches in my face. My uh, neck was broken. Um, I had been unconscious for two or three days. And Whoa. well, it was a career altering kind of uh, thing. So I was driving from Houston uh, to Colorado Springs. And in 1979 was the worst ice storm that North Texas had experienced. Someone even froze, I think, in that particular uh, cotton bowl in Dallas. And it was this um, weird ice that um, that you can't see. You know, I think they call it clear black ice, whatever. whatever. Um, and you can tell because the trees get wet and they and they kind of they start to fall. They start to fall over, not completely, but the, the weight of the ice is, is so much that all of the trees were bending. And literally it's all over the road and you cannot tell. Uh, and as a typical cadet, a stupid cadet, I was driving back and it normally would be about a 16 hour drive between Houston and Colorado Springs. Yeah. And you had to really sign, you, you physically had to sign in at that, you know, at, at an hour, you had to be there and physically sign a log this is, you know, I got That's here right. at, at at a certain time. So yeah. it's a it's a real timeline. It's a real it's a timeline. And so I would sure. go, oh, you know, it's about 17 hours to that sign and I got plenty of time. <laughs> okay, well that's crazy <laughs> and stupid. Okay. Uh, yeah. so I hate to admit that I was that irresponsible, but I was. So I was probably driving a little too fast, um, and I was on Highway 287, um, right outside of Fort Worth. 
I really okay. won't forget that part. And then I got to the top of a hill and there was an accident in front of me. I had a little Toyota Celica and I go, okay, what am I going to do? I, this is happening really quickly because if I keep, I'm going to run into the accident. There's no doubt about that. And I'm tapping the brakes a little bit and it's just not, and I'm going downhill. It's just not going to work out well. So I go, uh, even though I got a C in physics, I go, you know, if I put this little silica <laughs> up, up against the guardrail, you know, it's not going to be good for the car, of course, but um, that'll sure. slow me down. Enough friction, that'll slow me down and everything sure, will be sure. fine. I'll just have to fix the car later. Apparently, sure. my engineering skills weren't, I didn't plan that perfectly. Of course, I didn't have time to plan. And I went over the guardrail and oh, no. uh, about 150 feet down off the bridge. Oh, my gosh. Now, to be honest with you, I don't remember anything after that for about three days. I remember waking up in a hospital. Uh, but I was... Oh, you're lucky to be alive. Yeah. So um, that was almost like if I were a kitty cat. Uh, that would have been number one, you know, life, life <laughs> right. number one. Uh, so it changed yeah. my paradigm from being a pilot um, to, even though I'd done everything, you know, I'd done T-41. I was a glider uh, pilot at the academy, you know, gone through the oh, okay. program and done that. So I was pumped and ready to to do it, but it it wasn't going to work out. So then my option were going to missiles or something else. And I went, um, nothing against missiles. We need missiles. Yeah. Uh, but right, right. Missiles is not, that's not for me. I mean, it, it wasn't right. ever going to be for me. And I remember uh, talking to some NCOs that were parachute NCOs at the academy that were combat controllers. And I thought, okay. You know, I think uh, I'd really like to to do that. And um, I got the, I, you know, I called, I begged, I was begging, begging, calling, begging, calling, calling. We didn't have a selection system uh, back then. So basically one okay. or two people could actually make this kind of decision. And that person was a, a Major Fagerson at uh, uh, MAC headquarters. So I okay. called and begged, called and begged. And he had been academy grad. So I think he kind of, you know, understood and, and boom, I, I get um, a slot at Hurlburt Field. I mean, I couldn't have. Nice. <laughs> I, I have no idea how that happened. I mean, you know, it's not like I, I went right. through a lot of selection kind of thing. And was the top this person and top that. No, it just, but how would you like to go to Hurlburt Field? And at the time I thought, okay, I, I mean, I really didn't know. But when I looked sure, at sure. it, I go, oh my God, that was the, I, I, you couldn't give me a better opportunity than that. I, I love that. Opportunity. Right. I mean, I, I, I loved everything about it as a second lieutenant. Um, yeah. Gonna be come. I wasn't a combat controller yet. I was gonna be. So I got assigned to, to Hurlburt before I had been through combat control school, before air okay. control school, before scuba school, before demolition school, before all of that. Yeah. Um. Now I'd done jump school and 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 free fall at the academy, so I I, I had that. I had that, but. That doesn't have anything to do with combat control. So I, I, I look back at it and I go, man, I was the luckiest, luckiest person on this planet. And, <laughs> and why did I get that? I have no idea how, how yeah. I, I mean, uh, that's why I go. Well, I mean, you, you put out the effort, you called and you keep, you know, you, oh, yeah, you, yeah. you showed the guy, yeah. you, you know, how interested you were and, you know, your, you, your tenacity would probably got you through it, you know? So, and, and life at Hurlburt Field as a second lieutenant, combat controller, was so fun. I can't describe <laughs> it to you. 
So yeah. think about it. I was single. Um, Fort Walton Beach, nice place to go. Yeah. Although I wasn't there a lot because all the training would take me away from Fort Walton Beach. But still, single, sure, sure. Fort Walton Beach, second lieutenant. Uh, nobody works for me at all. So I have literally no responsibilities. And <laughs> right, I'm literally right. a wet behind the ears second lieutenant. So everything to me, everything was exciting. Everything. Yeah. One night I'm flying on gunships. Now at the time we had uh, H models and, and A models. So I get to fly on a gunship, you know, and sit next to the FOCO and, and do those kind of things. And then, then the next night, na- and then the next day I could, I could fly on an O2 with a Vietnam FAC Raven pilot. And he'd be talking me through, you know, range control procedures and all these kind of things. This is before I went to combat control school. Um, wow. And then the next night, I'd be doing a, an insert uh, on a, a UH-1, uh, you know, a helicopter, uh, you know. And, mm-hmm. and, and then I'd be doing an, uh, I could be doing a jump, a water jump in the sound at Hurlburt, you know, getting out, derigging, mm-hmm. getting the boat, you know, getting in the boat, you know, motoring off. And then making a, you know, on Fridays we do a demolition shot. So you know we'd go set up our little C4 things, you know, pop a cap in there. Boom! I'm, I had so much fun. I I can't, I can't describe it. Um, I loved right, every, right. I loved every second of it. L- literally, yeah. I loved every second of it. Um, nothing was a, a drudgery, if you know what I mean. Um, sure. And um, but I don't have some problem where I get uh, bored easily, but there is no way you could be bored. Right. There, literally, there is no way you could be bored. Um, and I, I loved it. And we had some unbelievable senior NCOs because everybody who taught me anything of value were all NCOs. There was only one officer, and that, he was the boss, uh, Major yeah, yeah. O'Brien. Good guy and all, but he 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 didn't have time to teach me anything, you know. <laughs> like look, yeah, and and NCOs taught me everything, everything. And these NCOs are probably just had gotten out of the war, if or a few years before or something. They probably had a lot of combat experience. When you say or no. Well, it would. And I tell this story and I've told this uh, publicly uh, many times before. There was a particular person. I'll, I'll, I'll mention his name because it's, it was Master Sergeant Tony Renda who would. Um, oh, yeah. Have, uh, he, he, he had many sons. I think he had five sons, if I'm not mistaken. But. I was told after I got back from combat control school and I was a qualified combat controller. And I could wear a beret, you know, I mean, and be valid or whatever. Doesn't make you competent right away, but it it means you're valid, okay? Because, you know, you get your beret and you get all. So I was given, um, not command, but I was made the scuba team leader. We had a Halo team and a scuba team at Holbrook a long time ago. It was in the first special operations wing and we were a doz so we weren't a squadron we didn't have squadron jet or anything like that we were a, a, almost like a staff agency to the do who now we say the is the a3 or the group commander the ops group commander that was what the gotcha. wing okay. was that in today's parlance that's the ops group commander so an ops group has okay. multiple squadrons so uh, multiple squadron commanders reported to the um, to the DO, okay. and we were a staff function, but the team was a, t- a team. It was the you know first South Combat Control Team uh, attached to the first South. So 
I was made that, you know, I was finally in the chain of command, if you will. I was the scuba team leader. And so they tell me, <laughs> you're going to get our top NCO is going to be your NCOIC. I go, I, I'm, I'm ready. I'm, remember, I'm a second lieutenant. I'm a second lieutenant. Okay. And so I go, you know, I did learn something at the academy. I'm going to study their um, their profile. Their, their, I'm going to pull the records and study the records so I know. So I'm a, a kind of a, not, in today's term, to be a sensitive boss or a knowledgeable boss. <laughs> hey, you know, this is going to be my intro. I see, I want to know something about it. So I pull sure, the records. Sure. And, you know, my records are like, you know, a <laughs> right. folder and you got a couple pages in there, you know, a couple of yeah, yeah. schools. That, that's it. That, that, right. that, that's it. And You're right. so Tony Orenda's record was like, uh, like really thick. And I went, OK, you know, you know, sometimes if you have a really thick record, that could be good or that could be bad. You know, I mean, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Let's just say in Tony Orenda's, it was heroic. So I open it up, and befi- besides all of the EPRs, I think we we don't call them EPRs now or wh- whatever we call them now. But 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 they were enlisted performance reports sure. back then, and yes, they were uh, they were all glowing. But it was the combat decorations that literally. I almost fell on the floor because, you know, they start off, you know, bronze star, bronze star, air medal, air medal, uh, you know, air medal, a silver <laughs> star, you know, and I'm going through this and I'm going, all of a sudden I go from kind of excited to he is going to eat my Love. Think about it. You make movies like this. Yeah. Young, <laughs> dumb, wet behind the ears, second lieutenant, you know, that wants to do the Wednesday. Well, we're having our our war college prep classes or, you know, something like that. <laughs> and here's the experienced right, right. warrior hero uh, NCO. It, yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of like the movie with uh, Clint Eastwood. You know where he's the he's a marine. Uh, he's the he, he's already. Oh yeah, yeah. He, Heartbreak Ridge. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Sorry, this young uh, dumb officer going. Well, I'm going to you know the war college studies now. I, okay. Anyway, the <laughs> the dichotomy is just weird. So I said he's yeah. gonna eat my lunch. He's gonna eat my lunch. Right. And senior officers are gonna watch. And they're going to laugh because it'll be funny. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, exactly. it's just, it's naturally funny. Isn't it? <laughs> right, right. Uh, so, well, I was wrong. Tony Renda, greatest thing that ever happened to me. Not only a great NCO, but he was perfect for me. And, you know, you're a second lieutenant, and so you do a lot of things. Like I was trying to screw up, not intentionally trying to screw up, but second lieutenants just yeah. screw up because, uh, sure. I don't know, it just happened. Tony Arenda right. was perfect. In front of the troops, you know, we had about 12 guys. It was, yes, sir, yes, sir, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. Yes, sir, we're moving forward, boom, boom. And if I was about to do something really stupid, then when everybody was gone, everybody gone, and it was just one on one with Tony and me, you go, sir, can't do that. It's a bad idea because oh. this, this, and you explain everything in such precise detail, like you would get from an air traffic controller, a forward air controller, a combat controller, you know, a tech, like you would get that because of the precision that they bring to it. And 
And he introduced right. me to that, what I call professionalism, professional precision as a second lieutenant. Mm. And, um, you know, so all, all my promotions and those kind of things, Tony Arenda, even after he retired and everything, was always there. And he's a great American hero from Vietnam. And yeah. on the mission that he was on at an airfield in uh, Vietnam, uh, Joe Jackson, a C-130 pilot, would get the Medal of Honor coming to pick up the combat control team that Tony Arenda was leading. So that mission was an intense uh, Vietnam, you know, a- ambush, attack, respond, and the C-130 coming in to, to pick up. And Tony Arenda was the guy uh, leading the charge on the ground. So um, I would have other NCOs that have similar Vietnam accolades that were to say that I was impressed is it just uh, it uh, um, it just doesn't do it. I, I don't I don't know what term right. you can have, but they were so guiding in their instruction uh, and support to me personally. And they didn't have to you know they didn't have to be they they had risen to the very top uh, of the business. Why 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 do they need to take care of a of a stupid second lieutenant. They didn't. They didn't have to do that. If you know what I mean. They, it, it sounds like that's the kind of guys they were, though. Don't you think? Like they were just such hard charging, like just just hardened veterans that they're they were like, this is the right thing to do. Just great Americans. It seems like, don't you think? They were. They were. And all of the big notables, uh, you know, I got to to meet, and that's the uh, the chief. Mike Lampies and the Chief Crutchfields and the Chief Wayne Norads and the right. the the PJ the Chief Wayne Fisk and you know I mean I could go on and I go I was privileged once again to be around those people it's just yeah. it's just it's just a fact so that's why when people say you know how did you get to where you got I go, well, I don't know. There's about a thousand people I need to thank personally and individually. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm probably undercutting someone. I, I, right, you know. right. So anyway, that that was uh, so life at Herbert was fun. And I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's very professional to tell young TACP officers or whatever, but I, it's the truth. I had fun. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to have fun. I loved having fun. Um. Sure. And um, it was um, a, a remarkable experience, and I learned a lot. Uh, second lieutenant, and actually uh, made first lieutenant, and then captain uh, while I was all at Harbor. That first assignment. Okay. So that was my first assignment, and I, I feel like it was the greatest of all time. We didn't log at that time. We didn't log controls. Mm-hmm. Um, you know the number of controls, but. I'm guessing I I was on the range every night and it was even so you say so you got something pretty proficient. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and you make a whole lot of mistakes and gunships are the greatest uh platforms to make mistakes with when sure. you're not live, you know, when it's All right, right. So I would say, you know, target is, you know, you know, 5 meters at this or you know, you know, 50 meters at the, you know, and then go Okay, the Foco back come back and go. You meant um, 180 at five or 180 at ten or what? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. We see him. We got him. You want us to take him out? Yeah. <laughs> that kind of learning environment. Yeah. What I think we miss today. I don't. I'm not quite sure we're giving that kind of learning environment. To our young, um, you know, officer or enlisted, I I, I, don't, I don't know. Sure. And if we're not, shame on us, because yeah. yeah, training and more training and more training and more training. When if you make a mistake, people's lives aren't going to depend on that thing that can be fixed. 
and you can fix it in a debrief and you can fix it in another learning session or you can fix it with more training. That's the kind of environment yeah. that you want. Um, I learned about a fighter pilot debrief before I even knew a lot of fighter pilots because the whole soft world did the, the debrief like that. No, you were here. You said you're going to be here. You weren't here. You were here. The rendezvous time was this. You didn't make that. You know, I mean, I mean, it, it, there was no rank conscious or any. It was mission focused. And the data and the information from that mission was not only rehearsed before, but was, you know, battle briefed afterwards. And sure. There go the fighter pilot debrief the whole debriefing mechanism and um it was the the best learning environment that you possibly could have so whatever we're replicating in the future whether we're all digital whether we're all of it's online or not the closest we come to getting to that kind of preparation doing it and then talking about it without without the rank and the uh, without the protocol just the focus yeah. on the mission that's that's what we need to do i mean that's the right sight picture in, in in my view yeah i agree and that's what i got at Herbert. like every day um it became in, it became embedded. yeah there's nothing more valuable than guys that you respect telling you exactly what you did wrong and how you should do it right. You know, that's, it just sticks with you. I mean, that that's an invaluable lesson that I think, I think they're doing. Um, but like you were like, kind of your, like you were alluding to the assets just, just aren't there. The repetitions are what these guys are lacking. Right. So uh, like you, like you said, you're on the range a lot. I used to be on the range a lot when I was a young guy and it just slowly got less and less. And now we're trying to look at simulation and we're trying to look at, you know, a, a guy in the next room on a radio and I, I don't think it quite has the 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 impact as as kind of like our experiences you know? right now you can do a lot of things through simulation and one of the the big things as a controller you can get the the verbal part and there is a, there, sure. as you know there's this verbal part to trans to translate in the three dimensions of information between either a you know, a flying system or a ground system, and you're trying to interrelate and you're trying to provide data, whether it's a, a nine line or other kind of data, you can right, right. You have these, you know, these verbal challenges. But once you get that worked out in the simulation, which your simulation mm -hmm. is great for, is that you need, you need to smell See, right. hear <laughs> the result of your control. Yeah. There's nothing more exciting than to call in an exact target, especially with a gunship, because you can anticipate, in this case, remember I was A models and H models, a 105 uh -huh. howitzer and you got to see it, feel it, hear it, smell it, okay, it, and control it. The, there is right, no, right. there is no substitute for that, um, and you don't need a yeah, lot of that. But some of that, with all the other training that you're going to do, is literally worth its weight in a 105 shell. <laughs> right, for sure. So, and I got to do that almost every day at Holbrook. So, yeah, I loved it. Um, but people were telling me, you know, you know, we're going to create a new uh, numbered Air Force staff. And it because, you know, this is uh, good for your career. And I went, so I went from Holbrook Field to the brand new 23rd Air Force. And at the time we had taken... Uh, the first special operations wing, which used to be in Ninth Air Force in Tactical Air Command. Okay. And the only real soft unit that we had, except for the very special 
Debt One Makos, the our other national mission element that John Carney started um, in Maine. Okay. So this was intact, and then we the entire Air Force changed. We took all of that out of TAC, the Tactical Air Command, and the first SAL was under 23rd Air Force, which was created under MAC. So the Military Airlift Command okay. 21st on the East Coast, 22nd Air Force on the West Coast. Then they had 23rd Air Force uh, for SOF and Rescue. And then the way SOF okay, and Rescue yeah. was broken out, there was a 1st Air Division and a 2nd Air Division. 2nd Air Division were all SOF, and the 1st Air Division was all uh, rescue to include all the helicopters pjs uh, uh c-130 refuelers all all of that and so i got to go to scott air force base at headquarters 23rd air force as a a very young captain uh i normally wouldn't recommend that to go into and everybody in the headquarters mm -hmm. is senior to you everybody yeah <laughs> everyone so Way. Kind of back to where you begin, where you started in Herbie when you were the second lieutenant. Now you're you're almost back to that level right. at this next assignment. So and to be honest with you, <laughs> the senior NCOs outranked you too, and I'll tell you why. Because they were picked for their expertise, and they were senior NCO, and they wouldn't be at the higher headquarters unless they had uh, stuff going on. And it just so happened that we had two PJs at 23rd Air Force. Um that had gotten the Air Force Cross and multiple distinguished flying crosses in Vietnam. So wow. it was like, uh, once again, I go from this soft world where all these <laughs> heroes are there, and then I go to this uh, numbered Air Force where you've got all of these heroes. I go, man, man, I'm surrounded by heroes. I'm, I'm literally surrounded by heroes. Um, but I've got, you know, I've got my National Defense Medal. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and my marksmanship ribbon. Yeah, right. Oh, and a longevity. I had a, a longevity ribbon. So, you know, I was. Oh, okay. Oh, wow, nice. <laughs> Getting that rack started. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's not that you make those kind of comparisons, but it is weird when you're standing next to someone, um, you know, like a, a hero. PJ, you're standing there, they're in dress blues, you're in dress blues. And, you know, they've got this, and you've got this little thing, and they keep calling you sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels weird, I'll bet. It's, it's, I'm telling you, it's weird. Because I go, <laughs> uh, uh, okay, you know. And that, I would be corrected all the time. I, I, cause I'd normally respond. Yes, sir. And they go, sir, I'm not a sir. Uh, 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 okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, that's the environment that I found myself in. But once again, I consider sure. that to be privilege. Uh, oh, for sure. I mean, who gets the privilege of being with those kind of warriors at Herbert field and with those kind of warriors at uh, 23rd air force, a brand new numbered air force. And that's where I got kind of uh, schooled, if you will, and knowledgeable about the PJ, uh, side, the rescue side of the house, uh, being at 23rd Air Force. So, mm -hmm. um, and when they asked me when I said 23rd Air Force to be a, the uh, detachment commander for, we were transitioning, everybody was transitioning in the halo business. We were transitioning the square parachutes. And I know that sounds like, haven't we always been jumping square parachutes? <laughs> we haven't. Yeah. We jumped round parachutes. They were called paracommanders, PC-24, something like that. But you would, you could do a halo, and your canopy was not square. It was a round canopy. Uh, and so all the things you had to learn as a jump master were just as difficult in terms of spotting when you were – spotting as a jump master because it's oh yeah canopy uh and 
So you weren't you? There was no. I mean, you might have had the steerability of like a dash one. Yeah, you did. I mean, it had toggles, and it was like um, it wasn't just like a T10. It was because you had the toggles. But at best, you you know, if you pull down on one toggle, you know, you only got like a panel or two that would fold under, you know, to to make the turn. And so your turn wasn't sharp, but it was mm, okay, and then. All right. So you had to be a better spot and you had to learn, you know, that in the analog way, you had to learn that um, by eyesight and experience. I mean, you, 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 you couldn't do it uh, without that. Okay. So the task was to transition all the PJs to square parachutes and to, to halo. Cause not every PJ, PJ had been, Halo, and not everyone uh, had a square parachutes. So I was made the detachment commander. Now, once again, now at this time, I've got, I don't know, I've probably got about 50 jumps. That was it. And I was the detachment commander. (laughs) And I had uh, six PJ instructors. Not one of them had under 1500 jumps so you have to know that am i going to teach them anything well the the answer to that is really (laughs) obvious i'm not going to teach them anything right right, right. are they going to teach me well of course they are but still i'm the detachment commander (laughs) and responsible yeah so and their program that that already worked out their curriculum was uh was tough and they put students through the ringer i mean and the students had to repack their parachutes so you'd make and basically we got a lot of helicopter lift functions just like they were elevators and so and each pj had would have about two or three students um the maximum was three and so We'd be just be doing elevators all day long, all day long. So up, jump, get down, repack. You got that? You got this? Got that? Back in, up, jump, you know, repack. And when you actually do that, I'm talking about, you know, so a, a lot of the students were getting, I know you, you think I'm going to make these numbers up. They're getting nine to 10 jumps a day. That's a day and it was massive. And so the only officership thing that came into it at at about day three, I go, there is no way with this op tempo. I've never seen any kind of op tempo like this. You know, the Green Bay Packers in the day or the Kansas City Chiefs in the day, you know, with two days. Bull. The, a two a day would be right. one fourth of what these guys are doing. You know, like yeah, it, it's crazy. And I actually saw the. I mean, it sounds like a lot of fun to maybe the 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 to the person on the outside, but man, it's exhausting. I mean, we used to do like four or five a day, and that that was like the max we could do, and that was a, a long day. That was an exhausting day. I can't imagine doing ten jumps, having well, to repack and like get back on. Oh, it's just amazing. So this is where. This is where L.A. comes in. So I remember going, okay, guys, I got to talk to you. I go, (laughs) I love you. You're smarter, better, more experienced than I do. But I'm seeing this from a weird third party. And I think the students are exhausted. And the learning value, and I'm not an expert at, at, at instructional things but the learning value was decreasing the more jumps it's supposed to be expanding a little bit you're supposed to you know have a your your horizon should actually grow the, the right with the more training you should be able to see more things and a lot of students were making the same kind of mistakes over and over again and we even had the latest and the greatest of technology so There'd always be um, 
uh, a camera guy, and it would uh, we called it advanced freefall AFF. And so mm-hmm. um, after they did these jumps, then you would get with you know, so you'd have a camera guy, and you'd have one student and one instructor, and they would be like this. For others, there would be one instructor, one instructor, one instructor to one student. And when I saw that, I went, okay, that's the answer. The answer to the op tempo problem is do exactly what your advanced free fall, because I saw the difference between just up and down, up and down, up and down, and this advanced free fall method. And I said, who came up with this advanced free fall method? And they go, we did. I go, you've already got your answer. That's, yeah. that's the answer. <laughs> because in one jump, then the student not only gets videotaped, but he's got three different perspectives from an instructor that tell them, this is what you do. You know, you got, you know your legs got to be, okay, you're too stiff. You, you, know, uh-huh. you, you got your hand, you know, I, I, they can critique this all, and then you can see it on the video. And it's amazing. Yeah. They agreed. I said, just do that. What you guys came up with and not a hundred elevators and the quality of your instruction will improve. They decided to do that. And then I said, there's one other thing I'm going to now mandate. We take a day off at day number six or seven. Day off. Everybody. Students, everybody, day off. I don't care if people stay in the room, eat Cheetos, drink, you know, watch football. I, I, I don't I didn't care. Complete day off. Yeah. Then I thought, I thought, oh, see, I'm 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 so brilliant as a detachment commander, you know, I've, I've applied my oh, officership to this uh, you know, to this problem. Yeah. And then I found out. We were in California doing this. Then I found out that all the PJ, you know, I couldn't find them. You know, I, of course, it was their day off. I said, I don't want to see you. I, that, and they took me literally, and they went to another location to go skydiving. <laughs> that sounds about right. That sounds right. <laughs> and then I found out, you know, later that night, I went, how's your day off? You go, oh, great, man. I got 15 jobs in. I got 15 jobs. How did you do that? (laughs) Anyway, so the only thing I did. It's like you're missing the point, guys. Come on. We want you to take it easy. Was institute a mandatory day off at like training day number seven. Um, Okay. And then move to advanced free fall, which they came up with and they developed. Uh, on their own, because they're that they were that smart. You know, they developed a great curriculum. Yeah. They were just, in my mind, they were pushing the students. Just uh, uh, even back in the day, you know, when you could push students to the max. All right. Uh, they were pushing them too hard, and I loved all those guys. Um, but that gave me a view point into uh, the pararescue mindset, if you will. More than I, I, I kind of had the, the combat control mindset, you know, because that's what I grew up with at, at Herbie. Sure. Um, and then I got in that PJ mindset. Uh, so I mean, for me, as a young officer, it was very valuable. Um, yeah. But I wanted to get back to ops. You know, the staff thing was an even though I got to do all of the war fighting exercises at the headquarters and I learned a lot mm-hmm. there because I learned, you know, it's not just what you do on the tactical end. It's at these operational levels. Now we didn't have what we call the CFAC back then. There was no CFAC, but there was a, an mm-hmm. air command, you, you know, on, like a CFAC in yeah. charge of everything. Um, and we had what we, would normally have is a, an airlift air command. We call them COMALF, Commander Airlift Forces. It's a okay. term that we don't use now. You know, we use DERMOB 4 
now Director of Mobility Forces in the AOC. Mm -hmm. But back then we called them COMAFs. And that that's who the boss was. Of all, whether we were running airfields or whatever we were doing, that was our boss that we reported to. And the rescue guys didn't necessarily report to the COMAF. They reported to a rescue commander. But all of these commanders were at this kind of operational level that was much higher than the tactical or, or airfield level, if you will, and okay. exposed to all of that at a very junior uh, time. And that made an impact on me too. And I could list, there were great commanders that I worked for that had unbelievable experience and so i know i'm gonna beat this dead horse like over and over again but that's why i, I feel like i had an entire privileged career to be around such smart people good people yeah. warrior warriors that had a warrior mentality that had been to war a lot and had mm -hmm. seen a lot and I wanted to soak up every single lesson I possibly could from them. Uh, and uh, I remember their war stories. <laughs> okay. Uh, in other words, don't do that. Do this. Got it. Got it. Um, so I lived vicariously through them a little bit. Well, that yeah. brings us up to um, I made major when I was at uh, MAC headquarters. And um, I didn't think I would make major because people had told me, hey, you're, you're a non-rated uh, common control officer. You may make major, but, you know, it's kind of a 50-50 kind of maybe not. I have to tell you. Oh, really? I didn't, I didn't know it was like that. Oh, yeah. Way back. Now, this is before the current special tactics era. Sure, sure. But now everybody is. Okay. Almost every special tactics officer probably could be a, a GO. But back in the day, a long time ago, if you made major as a combat control officer, that was a big deal. Wow. It was about 50-50. And I knew huh. that. I, I have to tell you, I, I didn't care. Like, I, I go, okay. It, I mean, if I'm a captain, can I? Can I go back to Herbie well, <laughs> right. or, or to Fort Bragg and just, you know, like go out on the range every day? I, 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 can I do that? I, I mean, I literally would be happy with that. All right, right. But, you know, um, but then I started getting these uh, opportunities that people gave to me. It's not because I was some special guy. They gave me all of these opportunities. Um I have no idea to this day why I got these opportunities, but I loved each and every one of them. And uh, the opportunity to go to school and to be the second class of SAS, that's the School of Advanced Air Power Studies. I have no idea how okay. I got that opportunity, except I, you know, I, I applied for it and I got it. I got to go to the, you know, the Naval uh, Commanding Staff College. I, you know, of course, I applied for it, but it's not like I was, you know, the top guy over here, the top guy or the, the top academy graduate. Okay, never any of that. Um, <laughs> but I would always get more opportunities. And then I would get a job at the air staff working for Skunk Works. Um, I, man, that yeah, tell me a little bit about that. I'm not I'm not that familiar with that. Can can you even go into it? Is that something you can go into? Yeah. Or, so um, uh, we created this. Um, office and it's changed names uh, throughout the years um married after the actual skunk works at lockheed martin so there is a skunk work and they develop things like um, the sr-71 and those kind of programs um okay and they were very special programs and at the time they were called black programs so nobody knew about them but they knew a big chunk of money was going for this and it was going for some reason right. to Palmdale, uh, California, you know, where, where we do all the special uh, airplane stuff uh, without getting mm -hmm. uh, too much detail. And the air staff back in the late 
60s, probably early 70s, created an air staff office that they labeled Skunk Works because it kind of modeled. And what this group did at the air staff was the weird, unique things that n nobody wanted to talk about and, and some people. And so the way it was a great opportunity was every almost for a while, like every four star general in the Air Force had worked in this office. Um, and a lot of former GOs had, had cycled through this office when they were young majors or lieutenant colonels or something. Like that. So I go, oh, okay, how in the world do I, I get to go there? <laughs> I'm, t I'm telling you, I, I'm not trying to be humble. I, I don't know. Because the my yeah, yeah. my peers that were there, there was a major Scott Norwood, for example. He'd gotten a DFC in Desert Storm, um, was the top, the actual number one graduate from uh, Naval Command and Staff. And I was in Cana Naval Command and Staff, and he was the number one grad. I, I wasn't. He was. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I go, how do I get the same opportunity that this guy? And he was also brilliant, by the way. And he is. He's a, yeah. he's a brilliant guy. Um, he would go on to do uh, great things. And now he's a big SES, um, like the number one SES in indo pecom Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, a really smart guy. So, and then it just kept uh, piling on. So from there, um, I get to work for directly the Secretary of Defense for Cuban Affairs. Um, maybe it's because they, I, I don't know, I was Hispanic or I, I have no idea, but <laughs> they said, are, are you willing to do that? And I go, yeah, 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 <laughs> um, yeah, I'll do it. And we did special projects because at the time um, we'd had this issue with Cuba, because mm -hmm. you know we'd had the Haiti invasion or non-invasion, right, right, nice invasion, and we had another Cuban migration crisis um, develop uh, during the Clinton administration. So okay. uh, it was going to be another Muriel uh, boat lift kind of situation, and so uh, okay. the secretary. Of defense wanted someone who I uh, could speak to those issues. I learned how to speak to those issues, but it's not like I was some kind of PhD expert on Cuba or Haiti. I, I, I wasn't. I mean, I became an expert at their issues because that was sure, sure. and so it was right, right. on the job study, if you will, and do it rapidly and be familiar with those issues. And from there, I got to work for Mort Halpern at the National Security Council staff at the White House, working the same issue. Wow. I mean, why, uh, why do I get those jobs? I mean, I'd like to say, oh yes, it's because of my extensive resume or what, I, 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 that, that just wouldn't be true. I loved every job yeah. I had. I love the excitement. You know, I mean, it, it's kind of cool working at the White House. Yeah, I reckon. I actually sat in the desk that, you know, Ollie North sat in. But he was a lieutenant colonel. I was a major, you know, um, and working at the White House. So, because yeah, the yeah. old executive office building, which is right next door to the West Wing and, you know, the White House. Mm -hmm. So you have to go across this little street that's protected and then you go into the West Wing. But uh, my office was in the old executive office building. Okay. And we worked Haitian and Cuban migration. And so then literally every week I was flying from D.C. to Miami, Miami, Guantanamo, Guantanamo, Havana, Havana, Guantanamo, Miami, D.C., Miami, Havana, Guantanamo, D.C. Like every week I did that for a year. Oh my gosh! These issues, and so we had we resettled over seventy five thousand Haitian and Cuban uh, migrants, and so 
the current immigration challenge that we currently have, I, I'm, I'm very familiar because it's how I learned the, the legal aspects of the difference between, you know, someone who is uh, immigrating and that we would mm -hmm. call a migrant. Right, legal right. or illegal part, forget that just a minute, we would call them a migrant, okay? And we have many immigrants uh, from all over the world, and there is a natural process, legal process, to do that. And we, everybody's familiar in government with, with what that is, okay? There are those people that are refugees, and they have a different legal status than immigrants, because if they make it to our shores, we have an obligation, a requirement to hear in, in a legal sense what their their issue is, and they can stay okay. in the United States. I mean, that, that, that law, those basic laws haven't changed in a long time. We mm -hmm. have a weird view of it now because so many people coming across that are making multiple claims I, I, I I'm not I'm not going to either invalidate or validate uh, their claims but we think sure, sure. the experts that they're mostly immigrants who are immigrating illegally because they're crossing the border without permission now whether or not <laughs> right right they're they're refugees that that would have to be determined legally. And uh, we have a lot of compassion, just like I had compassion for 75,000 people that we all put and housed at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. We almost shut down oh all of the naval operations. And this is before, of course, we had terrorists um, that we would put at Guantanamo Bay from the wars in OEF and OIF. You know, before we did right, that, right. a decade before, we housed over 75,000 people that were escaping from both Haiti and and Cuba at Guantanamo Bay. And so that's why I was flying down there. And uh, we would work those issues um, day in and day out. And it was almost a weird kind of assignment because I was like operational, but I was at the White House. When you're at the White House, you really mm -hmm. kind of determine policy. You don't execute. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, who was famous for another reason in the Nixon administration, uh, Mort Halpin said, I really need military operational expertise. In other words, if we say to the military, you're going to house 75,000 people, will they push back? Yes. In a big way. <laughs> because how do you do that? Yeah, yeah. How do you take care? And be responsible for seventy-five thousand families and everything. How do you, how do you, how do you do that in a small little place? Yeah. And because um, it's not even their, that's not even their mission set. Like you, they don't even get trained on how to do that. Really, yeah. frankly, especially the Marines down there at Guantanamo. Exactly. Ex exactly. Yeah. Uh, I do tell a <laughs> quick little war story that um, I had a lot. You know, I would meet with a lot of. Um, non-government entities, you know, that were, were trying to help and, and, and some good, some bad, some political, some not political. And all, I'd be challenged a lot because they'd go, well, you know, those military guys are, you know, they're, they're, they're beating everybody and they're, you know, treating these people horribly. And I go, not true. It's not ever been true. And if you say that again, I will throw you out of this meeting and you will never have another meeting at the White House again. Because what you just said is a lie and not true. And so I would give them then a Marine story. I go, I want you to think about it. after these Marines have been on duty for over 12 hours, that what would they do? on their off time. I would find them mm -hmm. with uh, some of these um, groups that were providing, uh, you know, child care or some other uh, kind of NGO, you know, non-government entity. 
I said, those Marines, and I'm, you know, and I would, I would play it up. These Marines, you know, big, big muscles, you know, be in their t-shirt, you know, you know, they'd walk in there and they'd be sorting through tiny little baby clothes so that that's what they were doing on their off time. So if you ever say that about the United States military, again, I will make sure you never get an invite from the White House. Do you understand me? Well, <laughs> then found out, you know, because I only wore civilian clothes. Then they found out I was in the military and they go, oh, oh, my God. OK, uh, we see where he gets it from. I, I don't know. I, yeah. you know I, <laughs> I guess I had used my command voice too much or something or, or, or something like that. But I tell that story over and over again because people get it then. They go, yeah, great military people doing the job that they've been asked to do. You know? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think a lot of people have that misconception. They just see what they see on TV or movies or maybe that one little, you know, uh, that one anomaly that, you know, of a guy doing something horrible. And then it's like, well, the whole, we're just going to paint the whole military with that broad brush, you know, and it's, it's not fair. It's not, it's not right. Yeah, and it's not. So um, now in that particular case, I give them, I give the Marines a lot of credit. I give the air force credit. I give the army credit. Uh, I give the Navy credit for all of the things that they did during this time. And we, we reopened, an Air Force base, Homestead, because it had been devastated a couple of years prior by a hurricane. Oh, right, right. Uh, yeah. uh, completely devastated. And we'd moved everything off. And so one of the ideas that I had frankly come up with, and I almost in a nice way forced it down the DODs, I said, why can't we open up a facility at Homestead so that we can control the environment, not at Miami International Airport, and have every politician come be making speeches uh, and both republicans and democrats did, you know made speeches about this you know no we shouldn't yes yeah. we should no we shouldn't yes we should no we shouldn't yet and i was not trying to keep anything from the public but at at a certain time you you know we weren't hiding what we were doing but we could control the environment just a little bit better okay um I just think about our border patrol every day, what they're trying to do. Um, yeah. And it's, it's a thousand times worse than what, what we had it back then. Yeah. Yeah. So we reopened Homestead Air Force Base. That was my, that was my big uh, claim to fame, if you will. And it cost the Department of Defense a lot of money <laughs> that I had to get, <laughs> you know, that we had to get. DOD reimbursed for. But I'm sure that helped out a lot. Like only you were talking about with the, if we had a, a, a situation like that at the, at the border now, it might take some of that pressure off the border patrol. Cause like you were saying, I mean, people go down there and they kind of grandstand and they, they, they use them as, as like these political pawns and these border patrol guys just trying to do They're their just job. Trying to, like to make this thing you know? work. So, right. And, and I don't want to blame Democrats or Republicans. Cause I don't want to, uh, you know, because it happens both ways. It, it sure, actually sure. does. And I'm still a military guy at heart. So right. I don't people, I don't tell people that I'm a Republican or Democrat. I mean, people know that yeah. I'm registered conservative, registered Republican, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, they get to know that about me. But I don't want to profess those um, uh, domestic political issues in front of a military audience when I'm a contractor and I go in front of a military audience I don't you know because they're they're limited they 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 can't right you know uh, and so I don't want to put them into a bad situation I I do like to talk policies though you know stay on if we can stay on policies and not the rhetorical attacks that someone is xenophobic yeah. or racist or homophobic or uh, whatever phobic that I, I can't remember all of the phobics. I go, well, I <laughs> right. want to talk about the policy, this policy. Does it help the maximum number of people for the longest period of time? And can we afford it? Can we do that? Can we talk about yeah. those public policy issues? And I know that sounds Pollyannish, 
but I don't think so. I mean, I think I think it's the other way. I think guys like us look at policies because we're trying to get we, we are actually trying to get to a solution, whereas these other guys are just going down there, like I said, to grandstand and kind of get votes and you know make themselves look better, both sides. Right. And and it's like, what what? How is that helping? You know, I'd rather I'd rather we implement the policies or get rid of them if they don't work and then start finding a solution to the problem. But it seems like they're not, they're not really that interested in finding a solution. No, it seems no. like, uh, no, it seems no. like to me. That's disappointing. And I know a lot of my friends, my compatriots go, can we get back to some kind of debate in the country? And in my opinion right now, I think debate is dead. I think it's, it's yeah. literally dead. We bifurcated so much that we can't even we can't even talk our way through some of this because someone uses some kind of rhetorical device and you know it, it, yep. there, there is and I, I forgot the law that you know that the, the the social media law where you know you're you're online for just like one or two iterations and you get to okay. Okay, that's like the Nazis or you're racist or, oh, yeah, yeah. You, you know, you don't like, uh, you know, gay people or you don't like this or you don't like, oh, are you, it's the war on women or what? I go, ah, please stop. Right. It's not true. Can we just talk yeah, about yeah, yeah. what kids are learning in school? No, you can't. Do that. Yes. Uh, you're on there either on one side or the other. I go, well. Unfortunately, life is too complicated. It's it's for it's sure not that simple. If it were that simple, right? Then I go, okay, I'm with the A team or the B team or whatever. Yep. Right. But uh, yeah, can't do it. You know. And I taught debate yeah. at William and Mary and taught speech at uh, Thomas Nelson Junior uh, College. <laughs> and I told them at the time, you know, this was about ten years ago when I first got out. I said, debate, debate is dead. It's dead. Look at the major issues that we have, and we can't talk about it. Let's start right. Global climate change, which for whatever reason, it's up on everybody's list. I said, okay, you cannot have a reasonable discussion about global climate change without some person saying, if, as soon as they disagree, you're a denier. A denier of All right. You're denying science. No, I'm not. Yes, you're right, denying exactly. science. No, just because I am not agreeing with the solution that you're proposing doesn't mean that I'm denying the science behind something. That that that's not true. When you say right, that, right. it it could sound nice, uh, but it's not nice. It, it's yeah. it's actually a lie. You probably know it's a lie, or you're guessing mm -hmm. at best, and you think that I need to be then muzzled because I'm a climate science denier. Mm -hmm. I go, okay, I don't know how to have a discussion with that kind of a person. You can't. Yeah, you can't. I mean, they've already got their preconceived notion of what they believe, and they have a solution to this problem, their solution. And if you don't, like you said, if you don't agree with it, then that's it. You, you're, you're on the bad side automatically. Right. It's like, wait, there's probably other ways to, to skin this cat. You know, let's try to work through it or, or something. I don't right. know. But, but you said, like you said, the debate. I mean, is it's just like, so. okay, I recycle a lot. Okay, what does that mean? Do I get a gold star for recycling? No, I should recycle. Right, right. I don't get any credit for it. I don't want to get any credit for it. I right. shouldn't get any credit for it because it's something I should do. Right. It, I just feel like it's something I should do. Maybe it saves some energy yeah. resources somewhere. We can apply that to something else. We can make products uh, cheaper. I, I don't know. I, I just, yeah, yeah. I, I would do it. But I don't want to be told then that I'm denying science because I'm against a politician flying across the world and telling me that they're good when they're burning more gas exactly. than I have ever thought about burning. I mean, yeah. Like I go. It's so hypocritical. I know. So hypocritical. I don't even know how to, to, to bring it on. 
and everybody has this yeah. kind of virtue signaling disease, you yeah. know. So, and I and I go, can we go back to the beginning on something? Just because you called this person out, it didn't solve a problem. It didn't Nothing. make them change. You could have hurt them. That's true. And it didn't bring any virtue to yourself. It really didn't. Right. You may think it did, but that's not how you gain virtue. <laughs> You don't signal to the world, hey, I've got virtue. So um, does everybody know that? Because I called them, right, exactly. you know, this bad person over here, or this bad person over here, or this bad person. Yeah. Yeah, truly virtuous people don't seek recognition for it. Like they do it because, it, like you said, I recycle because I think it's the right thing to do. I don't, I'm not like, you know, yeah. And they're, they're missing the point on yeah. virtue. Yeah. So, um I mean, I, I, I'm probably giving you too much philosophy, uh, uh, but, you know, you can only listen to so much of L.A. because I, I don't want to ever sound like the old grumpy man uh, kind of person. And then I realize when I'm talking to my kids, because my kids give me good feedback. How can I not <laughs> sound like the old grumpy person um, and still provide something of value? <laughs> to, to the people who are listening. Right. I mean, how, how can I make that um, uh, without? Well, I, I don't, th I don't feel that way at all. And I think it, I think it is a matter of opinion in the audience, you know, like you're, some people you're just not going to, you're always going to seem like that too, based on their, like their preconceived notions. But like uh, guys like me, I could sit here all day and listen to you, <laughs> listen to you talk. So, well, you know, don't, I, I think, it, I think it depends on who you're, who you're talking to, you know? So sure. I think that's a good uh, uh, thing that I would like to talk about. I, I want to tell you how impressed I was when I uh, studied uh, you and your your online presence. To me, oh. it's impre it's significantly impre impressive. Then I, I I read a lot of the things you wrote, and you wrote them for the purpose of helping to educate uh, you know the younger you know NCO. Or you didn't have to be intact, but you got all special warfare. Uh, all leadership. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't have to be the military because those rules, you know, that they don't just apply to military people. They can apply to teachers. They can apply to to firemen, uh, police, um, anybody that's in kind of public service, if you will. Sure. Um, those apply. So that's impressive to me. And the reason it's impressive is because. Okay. Even though I don't do it and I don't have that kind of online presence, I'm impressed by it because of the significance of the quality of the instruction or the message. The, the, it's the quality of the message that's important. And we have digitized everything in the future. You know, no analog. It's all, everything is digitized. All everything right. is. Well, I, everything is mobile. Everything is through a mobile app. I, I got, I got it. I got it. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying I can do it, but because I can't do it, that's why it's impressive to me because right. it maintains that yeah, quality yeah. that I'm looking for in a normal discussion. You know, where you get to the kind of meat and potatoes of an issue yeah. and the substance of a public policy issue, but to be able to do it. And I'm not trying to blow your skirt up, but, you know, online and in the new kind of way is impressive. It is. Huh. It just is. Appreciate it. it just is. Huh. Um, and for whatever you think about, like, for example, Donald Trump, I go, somehow that old person who'd never been in government before could take and have such an online presence. And I know he developed people that hated him. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I know he did that. I realize I'm not going. I'm not going to say go one way or the other on it. I, I, I'm sure. And uh, but I won't go into yeah, yeah. whether or not you know. I believe everything that Donald Trump says, or whether or not you know I agree with the people that absolutely can't stand him and hate him. You right. cannot argue with the success, the substantive success that he had in breaking into American politics. Now, some people oh, are going to sure. think he broke it, that he's he's the reason 
not a symptom. You know, they're going to say he's the reason, not a symptom. And then other people are going to say, well, he's a symptom, but with an antidote, you know, and his anecdote right. was to do this. Mm -hmm. Both of them make substantial arguments. But the reason we can't talk about it is because we can't have a public policy discussion like that. Right, right. Yeah. He's so polarizing that if you bring up, even if you say like, even if you, they'll, they'll never, if people that hate him can never concede any kind of positive point at all in his way. Otherwise they feel like they're letting themselves down or letting their base down or their side. And it's like, there's a, there is a way to uh, sift through all the stuff you hate about something or someone and find nuggets of goodness. Oh. You know, there, there, there are some things that are good in, yeah. you know, in, in the way he did his thing. I mean, right. yeah, for so, sure. You know, um, and it's just that discussion, uh, that uh, political bifurcation, polarization that you're talking about has invaded everything that we do. Mm -hmm. And I go, now pretty soon here, in about an hour and a half or so, we're going to watch the Super Bowl. <laughs> and to be honest with you, yeah. I just want to watch the Super Bowl. I don't want to get <laughs> right, right. A, a political commercial that tells me to either, even though we used to want to watch the Super Bowl commercials because they were funny and we tried right. to be funny. But we, we dumped all of that for some kind of weird political correctness. Uh, some kind yeah. of, and I go, I'm sorry. I'm a stupid old Batman. I just want to be entertained <laughs> and I want to eat Correct. my uh, chips and salsa with a little guacamole um, <laughs> and not get it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's what I want. There's so much I see like that. So much uh, entertainment, like you said, like I don't, I don't get to watch that much. So when I do sit down and watch something, I don't want to be preached to. I want to, I, I know what I, you know, I, I, if I want to seek out, uh, you know, political things, I will seek them out. But if I'm seeking out entertainment, I, that's what I want. I don't want to be, want. you know, that's like I don't want to. Yeah, exactly. That's um. Yeah. And I'm the same way. Um. That's why you know, and people can pick and choose what they want. And we have to, you know, we have so many choices today that literally, right? We're not in need of like more choices because we used to be limited a long time ago to, you know, three television stations. Yep. <laughs> that you didn't get digitally. Um, you got it through. Yeah. Um, aluminum foil rabbit ears, and that's how you got it in color, even. Um, and the news at that time was a guy who was just reading the news. He didn't put his spin on it or, you know, n not normally anyway. Um, normally it was just a dude just telling you what happened. And that was, that was it, you know, that, but now it's, now it's sometimes it's hard to even tell what the news is. You know, there's some people, you know, I'm not telling anybody, I'm not telling, saying anything that everybody doesn't already know, but it was nice back then when he would just read it and you found out what was going on and that was it, you know, no, yeah. No spin or no, no, nothing like that. It, so it absolutely is. And um, you'd asked before about um, if I had any messages for the current um, great Americans that are active duty today and are trying to do their damnedest to do the right thing, um, be combat ready, and you know, wade through all of the programming issues that we're going to have. And the message that I would give young airmen or officers is the same. You came into this business probably because it excited you. I mean, you can't just go, oh, I don't, you, you, I, I've never seen a person that we've ever selected. <laughs> This, oh, yeah, that's no, I don't want to do anything like that. Yeah. That's why they're not in this business. It does take a kind of like mindedness, but it doesn't mean we all think alike. But it takes a general mm -hmm. foundation for a like mindedness because we wouldn't attract the special warfare airmen of the future if they didn't act like and think like a little bit 
the old TACP, the old ROMAD, the old PJ, the old uh, combat weather, the, before I start, mm-hmm. the old um, combat controller, the, the, you know, the old ALO. Right. Um, there is something that ties the new and the, t- the last chief of staff uh, coined this phrase, new, new. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess there was old, old, uh, new, old, and then new, new. And, right, right. Um, uh, that was Jerome Goldfein, and I liked it. I liked the construct, and I actually used that because you know, he's the chief, and I want to use sure. uh, those thoughts uh, as it applies to joint all-domain command and control. And he said, we're in a new, new. And so the challenge with new, new is that you can't just take an old standard and paint it some way and call it uh, new. Because if you take the old, then then you're in the category of old, new. It's newer, old. They're suggesting that we're in this new, new. And the language associated with new, new is that we must, and this is going to sound familiar, we must reimagine something. Reimagine the tax ads. Reimagine tax P. Reimagine police forces. Reimagine government. Reimagine, okay. All right. I, I like the reimagine. I, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to it. But the requirement of the new, new people, I say, you still have to give me a little of that imagination and you need to spell a little of that imagination out. Saying the words reimagine something doesn't actually do what you say we need to do. Sure. We must reimagine. Okay, when are we going to start? What does it look like? (laughs) How big is it? How much does it cost? Do we have to train to it? Is it automatic? Will it all be AI? Uh, well, that's what we're. No, 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 no. I'm yeah. going to force you to giving me some of that imagination that's here in this new, new category. Now, what I hear in our new people is that they want to be in this new category. Well, I love it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Put it on paper, talk about it, train to it. Do it, apply it, execute it, operate it, command and control it. And here's the Missouri part that comes out in me. Show me. Right. If you show me once, I'm convinced. If you're talking it all the time, but you're never showing it to me, then you're going to have to convince me. I think we should be able to track first gen technology when it comes across the environment of the continental United States plus Hawaii and Alaska. And I used to hear from people in a certain command, hey, we've got this joint all domain command and control. We got it. We got it. I go, okay. So the first part of it is being aware of what's in your domain. So I agree with the Air Force Four Star General, General Van Herc who said we had a domain gap and we need to fix it. He's right. He was honest, truthful, and serious. It takes all of those things. Um, We can shoot something down. That's not a problem. Um, (laughs) And we don't need to get that issue involved in whether or not Republicans are upset or Democrats are upset or they're happy or we're not. Stop. Stop with the domestic politics. This comes with protecting the airspace environment over our country. So is that new, new? Is that new, old? Or is some of that really old, old stuff that we should have (laughs) never forgotten about? Yeah, that seems like very old, old. Like it should have never went away. It's like, how did we forget that part? Right, should have never gone away. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so the current group of folks have to live, I think, in this 
new, new world, that a lot of what they do is new, old, but I don't want them to forget about the old, old, because the old, old will help educate them on how fast the actual direction, the, the concepts involved in new, new. I'm, even though people don't want to admit it, that's the truth. And it's definitely true in yeah. joint all domain command and control. Well, I don't, I don't remember ever being taught anything that uh, just forget about all the old stuff. And we're going to teach you some new stuff now. Don't worry about map and compass. I got you a GPS now. You don't have to worry about anything. I've, I've never heard that before. So, like, the old, old is, oh, is always something you should know and have you in your hip pocket. But, yes, we should, of course, you know, progress to the new, new. But, yeah, never forget the old, the old. old. I mean, that's just day one. I didn't realize that the I mean, TACP yeah. Association, um, the convention in November, uh, that I went to, mm -hmm. I was guest speaker for part of it. Um, I was very impressed with the foundation and with um, the association for taking great care of our Gold Star families. Yeah. That crushing. was impressive. And um, while I don't have a lot of money, uh, my annual contribution will be up to the TACP Association. Just because they performed, in my view, all of the leadership of, of both, they performed brilliantly. And oh, I want to be nice. very supportive of that um, going forward. So the TACP Association, the Air Commando Association, the Soft Warrior Foundation, and the Wounded Warrior Foundation are really my biggies. Uh, as long as I keep something still going to the Red Cross, because the Red Cross is... Um, has been there my entire lifetime, you know, for for a lot yeah. of different people. Um, and um, I wish I had uh, more to give. Well, the thing about is, though, like if, if everybody gave what they could, I think, you know, it'd be we'd be a lot better off, you know, like, yeah, I'm the same way. I'm not independently wealthy either, but I give what I can. And I think if everybody kind of gave just a little, just it would turn little. into a lot, right. you know, obviously. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But they were. Yeah. They ran a, gr a great convention, and you know, I go, uh, I was impressed, and yeah, um, I want them to keep doing it, uh, you know, because I yeah. that and all the awards they gave for you know, the outstanding TACP, the uh, competition that they had mm -hmm. that was right prior to it. I love that, that's the way that, that's the right side picture, in other right. words, they're doing the right things. Those are the right thing. Yeah. As a young combat controller, I went to every combat control reunion and I got to meet even older guys uh, from Vietnam <laughs> and, you know, the original um, pathfinding combat controllers back in the 50s. I mean, my yeah, yeah. gosh, I go, wow, I wouldn't give that up for anything. Yeah. Well, our folks need to hear from. All of these, you know, and I can list, the, you know, all of the, the chief master sergeants in TACP from my era. But these are, these are in my in my view, they're like, they're godlike, if you yeah, know what I mean. I agree. Yeah, it's straight up heroes. They, they influence sure. so many people. Besides me, yeah. there's no doubt that they're heroes. But it's the, it's the amount of influence that they have in growing sure. a, a new new leaders, if you will. One thing that General Creech yep. is a former TAC commander from a long time ago. We named Creech Air Force Base after him. General Creech said the first job, the very first job of a leader is to create new leaders. So I know mission is always first, but you, even if you did the mission, if you don't have another leader that follows it, you, 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 you'll do no more missions uh, success. Sure. So you need this continuous crop of new leadership that are inspired and uh, knowledgeable uh, to make great things happen. And I've never forgotten about Definitely. it. You know, I go, I, something I read, he was a, <laughs> a big uh, total quality management person after he retired, you know, wrote the book, Total mm -hmm. Quality Management. TQM, and 
and uh, that's one of the quotes uh, that was in there. I went, wow, never forget that. And uh, I tried very hard to live up to, I'm not saying I did, but I tried very hard to live up to that, my time in the tax fee business, because I knew it was yeah. going to be limited. You know, you, you, you never know. I mean, you, you, you just right, don't know. Right. You have no idea what your next assignment is. So I had to keep the really good officers, get rid of the bad ones. We had a few bad ones. I won't name their names, but we had a few. And uh, my job was to cut them from the herd. And there are some remarkable officer heroes of mine that work for me. They're unbelievable. Uh, Shaq Beauchene, you probably are aware of Colonel Beauchene. Uh, Pete Donnelly, probably aware of Colonel Pete Donnelly. Definitely. Colonel Don Tharp, probably aware of Don Tharp. Definitely, uh, yep. Colonel Byron sure. Reisner, uh, you know. Uh, now yeah. I can go on and on and I, and, and I will, but it, it, I go without those, without those officers, our business would just not have, it, we, it wouldn't have worked. Um, I didn't have to tell them a lot except take care of my troops. Yeah. And they go, got it. It's funny you mentioned that because those names, that's the first thing I think of is um, looking out for us. You know, that all those guys, that's all they did was make sure that we had what we needed to do to fight, you know, to, to get to get the mission done or to be successful. I mean, that, that's the number one thing that stands out about all those names. So. Right. And uh, I, I love them to pieces because yeah, they're great. And the troops loved them. That, that, that yeah. I, I can guarantee that they were natural yeah. in this business. Now, all those guys that I just talked about were all rated officers. I mean, they flew something. Mm-hmm. Right. F sixteen, B fifty twos, B one, F fours. Uh, F-15Es. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So all those officers had flown those different airplanes. And so I appreciated that. And yeah. from the officer side, when I took over the 18th ASOC, you know, the, the NCOs were worried, okay, he's a combat controller. Is he going to, is, <laughs> is he going to wear a red beret every day? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm sure that was out there. You, you know, what is he mm-hmm. going to be like? Well, with the officers, yeah, yeah. there was another little thing, you know, like what they were talking about. Not not with me present, but, you know, what I would – For sure. intel sources. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right, right. You know, about, well, he's – I mean, and they didn't say it disparagingly because they were accurate. They go, he's a non-rated puke. Like, you know, he's, he's non-rated. Like, you know, <laughs> right. what, how could he possibly help us? Um, yeah. yeah. I, and they didn't mean it to be – to undermine it, but they yeah. were worried about how a non-rated puke like me would command the 18th day song. Right. And so I can remember the first thing. So I get to the 18th day song and I look around the staff. Now remember there are fighter pilots out in the in in my squadrons. But I'm looking at my staff. Right. I don't have one fighter pilot. Not one. I didn't have one. I immediately called the Ninth Air Force Commander, my boss. I said, "Sir, I got a problem." And he says, "Well, man, he says you just got there." I said, "I know." <laughs> and he was a fighter pilot, so he would understand it. I said, "Sir, I don't have one fighter pilot on my staff. Not one. This is the largest forward air control organization in the United States Air Force, ground or airborne." And right. I said, we have more Ford Air Control squadrons. Now, at the time, we weren't calling them Special Warfare Airmen, and we weren't even calling them Battlefield Airmen, because I was yeah. using the term, these are airmen that are in combat on the, of course, you weren't in combat yet. Okay. I said, but right, you, right. I said, there is not one fighter pilot. Okay. All right. 
Are you going to keep hounding me with this? Yes or no? It's okay. <laughs> what I want you to do now: this is a three-star general, and as uh, General Wall, and I think he liked me. I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't know if he did or not, but but he was very supportive. He says, "Go to the ACC staff and go to the director of personnel. Find a fighter pilot that's on the ACC staff, and you have my imprimatur. Tell the personnel." Put them down at the 18th they saw. <laughs> I did. So <laughs> who'd you end up getting? Stamp Walden. Okay. Yeah. And you know, he yeah, had flown good dude. um F fours and then uh F one seventeens. Um, okay. had all kind of air medals from I think Desert Storm or uh so I you know the personnel person gave me like you know like twenty records. And I went through them all, and I go, okay, that's what I want. So, <laughs> so the colonel that was in charge of him, I think it was an A3, or I can't remember. He calls me, and he goes, hey. And he didn't know me, so he didn't know that I go by L.A. or whatever. I heard you have it out for my guy. And I go, what? I, I don't. I don't what do you mean, have it out for your guy? Yeah. I handpicked him from the ACC <laughs> staff to go to the 18th day side. He goes, well, he's a pilot. You know, he, he doesn't need to do any of that, you know, air ground bullshit, you know, and, you know, nobody gets promoted in that job. Nobody gets this. Nobody gets that. This is, it's a waste of time. It's, you know, I, I heard everything. I heard it. Yeah. And I go, well, you and I, we're going to have to agree to disagree. Um, but let me tell you how it's going to work, Colonel. Because I'm a Colonel. It's yeah. beyond you and me as Colonels. Like, it's beyond us. The three star general has said this is going to happen. And it did. That's how Stamp Walden got to the 18th A side. And at <laughs> first, he was, oh, sir, do you, do you know I mean? I said, I love you already. You know. I said, now I want you to do this, this, and this. As yeah, it turned yeah. out, he was fantastic. And you know, he is working now. Oh, great guy. At a joint command at Fort Bragg. Right. Doing air ground stuff that right, he's right. the best in the world to do. Yep. Um, a, a great officer. Um, yeah. Now, we got him promoted once, but, you know, I, then I left. And so I don't know what happened after that. Yeah. But. But that was the feeling when I took over the 18th ASOP. And I, yep. so I think it kind of sent a message to all the officers that when I say something, I, number one, I'm serious about it. I'll listen to them. Yeah. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do something. And then I got guys promoted that their commander said, sir, there's probably no way you can get these guys promoted. I said, are they good? Sir, they're great. I said, do you need them? We need them badly. Do the troops love them? The troops love them. Mm -hmm. It's all I need. I'll get them promoted. I mean, so to get a, a passed over twice major, get them promoted to lieutenant colonel is yeah. not an easy task. Um, we got them promoted. And as it nice. turns out, they were just that, great officers, okay, troops loved them, great in combat, and provided yeah. leadership yeah. in the air ground business. So I'm very happy uh, with that. And then the other thing, I, I after talking to people at the TACP Association, you know, the 17th Special Tactics Squad and the 17th Special Tactics Squad. And, you know, they were, and I said, okay, um, do you know, do you know how the 17th Special Tactics Squad came to be? <laughs> well, you know, Soft Command just, you know, just automatically wanted us. And, you know, we were, uh, we were great in combat. That's true. You're great <laughs> in combat. No doubt about it. Actually, being great in combat was first. Yeah. If you think that there are people that wanted you, 
that's not true. I wish it were true, but it wasn't true. I don't say I'm the hero in this whole thing. You're the heroes because you proved in combat what I was yelling and screaming at people about. I go, hey, not only are they not going to let you down, they're going to save your ass. They're going to help win the war. Well, they're not special ops this. I go, what? What do you mean they're not special ops this? What, what, what are they not special ops? I've been special ops for longer than anybody at these in these rooms. I go, what What do you What do you think is special about them? Um, well, you know, this and this and this and this and this. And I said, the 17th right now, because at the time, we were all Rangers in the 70s, yeah. Yeah. except for 3rd ID uh, Brigade that was supported in the 17th right. as well. But the 17th was primarily Ranger Regiment and Battalion. Yeah. I said, they go day in and day out. They live, they eat, they sleep with the Rangers. Most of them have been through Ranger school. What is not soft about that? And they go, well, you know, and I go, I've been in special operations now, you know, when I was having these discussions for 20 years, I worked for the, I was a special assistant to the SYNC SOCOM, the four star in charge of all of special operations. It's at 23rd Air Force at Herbert Field, Fort Bragg, JSOC. All, I go, they are more special operations than I can think of. But without our guys proving it, that would have all, you know, people would have uh, blown me off. Yeah. I mean, they would have. But you can't blow off a warrior that saves people's lives, helps win wars, and a proven hero. You can't turn that down. I mean, you know, I, I don't care who you are, right, what service right. you're from, what rank you ever have, or anything. You you can't turn that down. You can't turn that down. That's yeah. Um, that's absolute. And so the story about Shaq Beauchene was really simple because after 9/11, the Fifth Special Forces Group, as you know, got a task uh, to go over through Uzbekistan yeah. mm -hmm. to do operations in Afghanistan and uh, we sent over uh, two small little elements one from the 22nd ASOF it was a light yeah. that worked directly for me at the 18th ASOF and then parts of the 17th okay that would do, you know so we took a little slice here a little slice here and sent them like we almost sent them without deployment orders, and that's a no-no. You -no. actually can't send someone to combat without an order. So, uh, but we had to fix that rapidly. But you know, we were in. Sure, sure. We got them over there. So I went to visit them, and I go, "You guys are great. You ready to go? I'm ready to go. We're doing this. We're going. You know, Tim Stamey's going down range. You know, uh, Steve Tomat's going to go down range. Okay, okay, okay. All right." Um, uh, Rock Davis is is going to sit in the talk and he's going to, okay, all right, all right. Um, you need more guys and you need more stuff. Well, sir, we're, uh, no, you need more guys and you need more stuff. Um, I love you. Keep doing it. Keep going. It's combat. Boom. Go. Let me talk to the Fiscal Forces Group Commander. And I've known him for a long time. Great, great commander uh, and hero. And I said, hey, John, this is John Mulholland. I said, hey, John, uh, I've given you a lot of good guys. I need to give you more. And I need to give you some aviators. And he goes, L.A. <laughs> no. <laughs> I go, yeah. He goes, no. I mean, in private, this is how commanders talk. We talk just like everybody else. <laughs> right. In the public, we we say 
nice things, appropriate things, you know, deployment. Sure, sure. <laughs> but when we're in private, we talk just like everybody else. Yeah. No, LA. You, damn it. Yes, you do. You need them. No, I don't. Yes, you do. And that, now, John Mulholland, if you know, he's a big man. Okay, yeah. I, I'm kind of a little guy. You know what I mean? Compared to him. And he was, sure. you know, he's got he, big. No, no, I don't need more stuff here. I, you know, I said, well, <laughs> okay, we just kind of got frustrated in the, in the actual talk. We were actually in the talk. And, you know, so he got a little frustrated. I got frustrated. Uh -huh. I get on the horn and I go, I call back and go, hey, Shaq, pack your bags, get your stuff, get on the airplane, get your ass over here immediately. No deployment order. No nothing. <laughs> My Voco, yeah. get here now. Now, why did I choose Shaq? I chose Shaq because I'd heard the 10th Mountain was going to follow there were going to be the kind of conventional land force that was going to come in a little later uh you know shaq had been telling me that he had been trying to prep the 10th mountain for a, a, de a deployment the 10th mountain right. was saying we don't need tech p yeah see everybody you know everybody's got great war stories but to know how it really happened how it really no shit happened it's it's another thing. So tenth of yeah. was telling yeah. us. Of course, now historically they'll go back and oh that's not. yeah it is true. They told <laughs> us no, we don't want your tack P. My message to Tenth Mountain at the time was I don't understand this. You're taking yeah. people yeah. that can shoot down airplanes. You know their air defense, thinking an air defense yeah, yeah. battery or platoon or something. They're taking air defense. I said but you can shoot down airplanes. But you can't talk to them. So the only planes you're going to shoot down have USA somewhere on the tail. So that makes no sense to me. And I'm not a rocket scientist. It makes no sense. So Shaq was going through that with 10th Mountain. They're not listening to you. They basically blew you off. and said, I know I, if people have blown me off my entire career. That's okay. Um, it, it, my feelings aren't hurt. I don't get, get, that's not how I work. I don't get my feelings. If my feelings were hurt, I'd never done anything. Okay. Because right. I was always told no, operationally. Always, always. Some, something is no, can't do this. Mm -hmm. So I go, if they come, they're coming to Bagram or Kandahar, or they're going to come. I, I, you know, I didn't know exactly the force flow for the Army. I said, but I, I guessed at it. I go, it's going to happen. And then when they get here, they'll go, hey, where are our Air Force guys? You know, the same guys that said, no, you can't come. Yep. I, I kept hearing the same kind of stuff over and over and over again. It, it drives me insane. People mm -hmm. who know me know that I get really, I, I get, when I start telling these stories, I get so emotional about it and I have to calm down. Uh, so I, I'll try to do that. But that's why I picked Shaq Boshane, because he was the 20th ASOS commander and was supporting at Fort Drum, supporting the 10th round. And he was my, at the time, my most experienced combat commander. He had been in Desert okay. Storm, okay, and was with the um, 6th, anyway, I can't, I can't remember the French. Anyway, he was with the Big Curve. Uh, and you, okay, a, a, a combat ALO, you know, so, um, and he was an all around great guy, you know, fighter guy. I go, Shaq Boshane is the guy, and so he arrives, and Mulholland didn't say anything, just let him, you know. Uh, now I go back, and then two weeks later, I come back after Shaq's been there, and I come back to see. You know, the fruits of my labor, if you will. All right. And John Mulholland grabs me, and this is what he says to me. Remember, he's a big guy. Yeah. LA. Remember, just two weeks prior, he said, No way in hell. Then he says, LA, 
you're never going to get him back. <laughs> That's that kind of story would replay time after time after time after time with NCO, airman, or officer. Yeah. So when people ask, why, why do you love these guys so much? Why, why did that? Uh, how could they have supported your career? I go, because of the way they were and how good they were. That, it, 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 this literally is yeah. the truth. Every story will have the same theme to it. It would happen right. over and over and over and over again. And when I hear about our American heroes like John Chapman and know how much a hero they, they, I mean, that's an American hero story that's going to be forever and it is forever. But knowing the stuff that happened in the background with people trying their damnedest to get air overhead during the heat of Anaconda. Right. Knowing that, and my John Chapman's a hero. That is not disputable, and I'm so happy and glad that Dan Schilling, who is a great American too, wrote so brilliantly in that piece, and they're going to make a movie. The whole thing is wonderful. The whole thing is wonderful for yeah. the country and everybody. Okay. For sure. Besides that hero, there is a Pete Donnelly, though that is at the talk in Anaconda with 10th Mountain and 5th Special Forces Group and uh, the Marines and uh, our Joint Command, our JSOC, all those elements. And the person who saved, that I deem saved more lives than anybody I can think of is Pete Donnelly. What Pete Donnelly did during that combat anaconda is um now i know a lot of people know about it but we cannot uh, i i can't even begin to express how much that we should constantly remember what he did and it saved lives um we would have dropped other bad bombs you know we dropped some bad bombs because we you know you had 37 we call them ETACs at the time, remember? We we didn't say mm, ETAC yep. yet. We hadn't developed that. But there were 37 ETACs in a very small battle area. And everybody, you know, with their unique combat perspective, and no combat perspective is wrong. I, I don't sure. tell someone who is in combat on the side of a hill, oh, yeah, you're wrong. No, no, no. I, you're not you're going right, to get right. that from me, ever. Yeah. A combat warrior is never going to get second guessing from me about whatever actions they took but it took someone realizing hey when we're going to drop a bomb a 2000 pounder a jdam whatever and we've got an elevation error problem because you know the difference between arming it at thousand feet two thousand feet three thousand feet <clears throat> it makes a difference um mm -hmm. and it's going to arm fuse properly whatever that all has to be calculated but when we drop a 2000 pound bomb i don't care who you work for whether you're talking to the president of the United States or you're with JSOC or Task Force 58 or the Marines or Special Forces this or Navy SEAL Team this, doesn't matter. A 2000 bomb doesn't give a shit. Right. If you're close to it, it's going to kill you. Period. Done. Yep. And you can't drop bad bombs in a close area because you will kill Americans or friendlies. That's going to happen. Right that's unavoidable. So we should avoid it. I mean, it, it's avoidable before that happens. And it takes the Pete Donnelly's sure. of the world and Pete Donnelly individually is responsible for what turned out to be successful. It could have turned out to be one of the biggest military disasters in the history of the United States of America. And I can, I will debate any army general, any soft general, any anybody at any time, any place with teams of PhDs that it would have been a disaster without Pete Donnelly. 
I can go to my grave knowing that that is true. That's why I love these kids. Wow. I mean, that's, yeah. that's why I love the beatdowns <laughs> of the world. Um, yeah. So the guy that was with me originally when um, 9-11 happened was Master Sergeant Tim Steen. Okay. So I had just come from a job working for the four-star SOCOM commander. I was a special assistant, and we had the Yudari bombing range incident before I took over the 18th ASA. And as you know, we, we lost some great Americans in that. And yeah. um, General Holland, just to show you how great a commander he was, he knew that I was going to take over this air ground group. Of course, at the time, it was a different group, and that's a different story. So. I was supposed to be the commander of the first ASOG uh, in the state of Washington. It okay. was under 12th Air Force at the time, uh, and it had one it had one weather squadron, an ASOS, and a little soft detachment. I think okay. it was yeah. the second bat, second Ranger bat, probably. That yeah, that sounds right. Fort Lewis. Sorry, really, my old man stuff keeps coming back. So it was at Fort Lewis. So. Um, Okay. That's where I was going to go, but he knew I was going to be in this air ground business. Uh, and so he let me, now this is a four-star travel, and the four-star travel, it's, it's a big deal. You know, you got ambassadors and everybody, you know, and he says, hey, Mike, I want you to um, take three or four days and study this Yudari bombing range incident. So he says, yeah, you get back to us, you know, you get back, you know, and he's in Qatar. UAE, you know, he's literally traveling all over the place. And so I went and I talked to the people. They were in the, you know, we had a little detachment that would come over and do the rotation. Uh, it was a SWAL rotation. And this is before OEF. They would do SWAL rotations in Kuwait. Mm -hmm. The 332, the um, expeditionary, it would become a wing, but the ex expeditionary group would kind of own the TACP when they got there. So we would send them, okay. and then they would report to the 332 AEG, you know, upon arrival. So I went, okay. I met everybody. Of course, you know, all, uh, these guys have been my friend, Face Nichols and Matt Newenswander. I'd known from the Air Force Academy and uh, Face Nichols, who was the commander. We had been to the group commander course together, and we just seen each other. So, you know, and says, hey, uh, I know that you're guys, but I love them. I'll take care of them. I said, okay, uh, take care of them. He says, but, you know, this is kind of devastating to us because, you know, we lost Special Forces and we lost uh, TACP. And, we, you know, and the issue was the, um, the laser um, and the F-18 uh, in, in, a, in sandstorm, uh, a desert uh, kind of environment. With the problem with the laser uh, or you know any kind of beacon you have a laser is that you 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 can see either the origin or the target you can see both of them right right but when you're looking at a, a laser a beam you, you don't know if that's the origin or the target you you, you don't know nobody knows. right right i mean we have m m more elaborate systems now and it's it's not as that simple but at the time it was just that simple so if you're in an F-18 sure. at five or 6,000 feet and over a desert floor where you can't see anything uh, and just a little obscuration, you know, up to maybe 1,000 feet, you can see the beam. That's a 50-50 chance. Sure. And so now I'm not a Hornet guide, so I just know that when you tell me it's a 50-50 chance, that's in the in the close air support business that I'm at. That is, um, if it's not 99.999% in the close air support business, it ain't good enough. Yeah. I'm not willing to take a 50-50 chance yeah. on, on a bomb drop, for sure. But we didn't, arguably, we didn't know it at the time. So that terrible yeah. accident happens. And I don't want to go over a lot of the names associated with it, but it's a terrible accident that happens. And it will live in my, in my memory that 
I didn't command anything then. I was a special assistant to the sink at that time. But I'd gotten back, so I'd gotten smarter on it. And then I left U.S. SOCOM, and I was going to go take command of the first ASOC. And my family was in Washington, D.C. They were about to get on an airplane. They were going to meet me in Seattle. Uh, our household goods were being shipped somewhere over Kansas about that time en route to the state of Washington. Um, we had a lovely on-base home at Fort Lewis. The first, uh, the, the I-Corps commander had sent me, uh, you know, a welcoming letter and saying, hey, you know, understand your call sign, you know, three-star general speaking to a colonel, it's kind of weird. And he says in the letter, understand yeah. your call sign is LA. So LA, welcome, you know, like he, he like, okay, you know, maybe this is all good. You know, I'm, you know, we're all happy. And I'm in a car. I think I'm in Louisiana or somewhere, you know, going from Tampa, Florida to Seattle, uh, Washington. And uh, General Holland calls me. Oh, the secretary does. He says, hey, Mike, can you talk to the, the general? Oh, my God. General Holland? Yes, I'm, I'm ready right now. <laughs> I want him to wait. I'm ready to go. <laughs> um, and he says, uh, hey, he says, where are you? How's it going? Yeah, he, he's so great. He was such a great commander. He's so easy. I love yeah. that man so much. He goes, where are you? I said, uh, sir, I'm on I-20. Uh, I think I'm almost to Shreveport. He goes, oh, okay, well. What I want you to do is oh, man. turn around at the next gas station. <laughs> he says, I want you to go direct to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And I go, Fort Bragg? Um, he says, yep. He says, uh, you're going to be the 18th ASOG group command. I go, no shot. I mean, that's what I wanted, but... You know, it's a newborn yeah. unit, yeah, yeah. I get to jump, I could do all those kinds of things. First ASOG, I couldn't have done that, or, you know, the other ASOG, yeah. I couldn't have done yeah. that. But meanwhile, all your stuff's, oh, like, yeah, stuff's heading going. that way. Your your family's getting ready yeah. to go that way. <laughs> so I immediately get on the horn to my um, my wife, who I consider to be uh, Superwoman. <laughs> She's better than Superwoman. Anyway, she um, she goes, so we're not going to Seattle? I said, nope. She says, well, we have plane tickets. I know. I said, but you haven't left yet, right? No, no, we haven't left yet. <laughs> so I said, don't, don't. I said, um, I'm going to Fort Bragg. I'll, on the weekend, try to come and get you guys driving-wise. Because, you know, from Fort Bragg to Washington, D.C., that, that's it's do doable, that yeah. Uh, but not yeah. Seattle. So. Uh, she turns around and then, you know, we get our household goods, you know, turned around and they're coming, you know, back. Uh, and I get to Fort Bragg and I'm the 18th ASOD commander. And I go, how does this stuff happen to me? I, I mean, that's what I wanted. That was my number one. But, you know, you don't get you, you don't get to pick where you command. You know, what was the catalyst? I mean, what ha what what changed everyone's mind? Well, like, this what, is what, what happened. The... And I don't want to mention names because these are all great people. So the guy who was going to go to the 18th ASOG, a great American fighter pilot, an A-10 guy, okay, who who was my classmate at the Air Force Academy, and an all-around great guy. Okay. And we were in the same group commanders course together, and I had prepared him to go to airborne school. While we were in group commander's course at Maxwell, we were running every day, push-ups, pull-ups. We were doing the whole thing. And I said, you're going to do just fine. I mean, I was with him for three weeks. You know, I said, you're going to do just yeah. fine. So you're motivated. You're a great officer. I said, actually, you're in better shape probably than I am. You know, I don't see a problem. There's only one thing you can't do in airborne school. Like, it's a no-thinking school. You, you literally, you don't think. You just do, right? But you just do, just just do it, and no thinking. 
literally, there's no thinking in this. Yeah. <laughs> I know that the army probably doesn't like me saying that, but it's it's the truth. There's no thinking in it. It's true. Yeah. You know, um, I said, don't ever say you quit. Even if you're hurt, they'll know if you're hurt because you just attempt to make the room or whatever. Now, you can go to the the doctor or I mean you can go to the clinic or, or whatever you can do that you know but don't ever say you quit never right okay he had called me and prepped me and this is before I knew I was going to the 18th day so he goes hey LA I just uh I didn't finish uh airborne school and I'm like what he says so I think we should swap assignments and I said Hey, you know, I know you're smarter than I am because you graduated in in the top of the class at the Air Force Academy. I was kind of in the bottom of the class. And I know you're a fighter pilot, so I know you're really smarter than I am. I said, but that's not how the personnel system in the Air Force works. We're told where to go. I said, we can't just decide to swap commands. It it, it can't happen like that. He says, okay. He says, "Well, well, let me work it. I go, uh, uh, okay, um, I have orders, I gotta leave, I gotta get over here, and if I hear different, I'll change. Well, no shit, I heard different. But it was from the Star General <laughs> telling me I was going to the 18th ASOG and not the first yeah, ASOG. Yeah. Um, and he would go on to the first ASOG, great guy, troops loved me. Turned out to be a great TACP group commander. He did. Mm-hmm. He, superior guy. Um, it's just that airborne jumping requirement. And frankly, from my point of view, when you try to make a a 45-year-old or 42-year-old Air Force colonel make him airborne qualified like that, that, that might not work. Yeah. You know? Um, it's almost like they should have put, should have made like an MTT form or something, you know, like, Hey, Colonel, come over here. We're going to put you through the paces. Yeah. And we're going to throw, you know, just, oh, yeah, yeah off, agree, offline or something. In the flying business, they would have given kind of an, an executive course to get up to speed in a particular weapon system, you know, and after he had, sure. a, you know, sim rides and real rides and they say, okay, get a check out. And now, okay. Yeah. Not now. So anyway, but for me, I can't tell you how happy I was. I mean, really, I can't, I, I, I can't explain it. And I go, how does this happen yeah. to me? I mean, literally, he was, like I said, top of the class, top of this, top of this, fighter pilot. I'm a non-rated puke. <laughs> you know, why does it happen to me? I don't know. Okay. But the question, and my dad used to tell me, he says, he says, don't look opportunity in the mouth and talk bad about it. Take it, run with it, go. You know, you can talk about it later when you're an old man, but at the time you take it, you you don't, you don't hesitate. You take it, you go, you press. Um, and, and that's what I did. So my first act as the 18th ASOC commander is I wanted to go to Udara. And I wanted to, to put people at ease. I said, this is the way I'm going to work when I make, because tra- I'm going to travel to see all my units. Everybody that, you know, because the 18th Egg Sock, we had Fort Drum, you know, Kentucky, you know, Louisiana, Alabama, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, you know, um, yep. and I wanted to see everybody. I wanted to see everybody and I wanted them to see me. So I said, when I make these travels, I said, I love my officers. I said, but I don't travel with officers. I'll have an exec. I don't travel with an exec. Well, who are you going to travel with? I said, an NCO. That's how it's going to be all the time. So what I want the chief to be doing and my officer DOs is figuring out which NCO at this level, and not a chief, uh, which, who should accompany, you know, the commander on this trip or this trip or this trip or this trip. I said, I'm speaking freely, and here's the rule. 
It's a little funny thing I'm going to do. They will carry my bags. And I will carry their bags. That's the rule. <laughs> That's how we're going to work it. So they say, they can say when they talk to their friends, yeah, I had to carry the colonel's bags. That will be true. <laughs> that will be true. <laughs> it's yeah, just some yeah. little, you know, I know it sounds stupid, but I'm done that. No, no. It's funny. I'm going to carry your bags. Yeah, yeah. You'll carry my bags. Oh, okay. You know, I, it just, <laughs> so the guy that they picked was Tim Steamy. And that, now it wasn't 9-11 yet. So we went over to Udari. It's my first big trip overseas. Yeah. Tim's a great American. And, um, and 9-11 happens. Oh, you were in Udari when all that I was, happened? I was actually when, on when the range. Was, okay. Physically on wow. the range. Um, and Tim was giving me his perspective. And he could, get, you know, I told him, I said, you, I don't, I, I want to know everything operational that you see as a problem or someone hasn't done this or someone hasn't done this, some training aspect, some piece of equipment. I, there, there's, you tell me anything. And I said, the only thing I'll be mad is if you held back and you don't tell me something, I will actually be mad at that. Yeah. That's the only way you could make me mad is not tell me something. You can't make me mad or upset by telling me something's broken or, you know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. on my face or something like that. You, you can't make me mad doing that. You can't. All right, right. But if you don't tell me something and you knew it, uh, that'll make me mad. You really will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, uh, I have a limitation. So that's one of my limitations. <laughs> and um, Sure. 9-11 happens and uh, one... I go to the TACP Association. I was just fast forward. I said, you don't need to introduce me. You know, um, you know, Michael Longoria graduated from high school and then he went to the Air Force Academy and, you know, did some things and, you know, was at the bottom of his class and he saw the error of his ways in third grade and became a kind of a good student in the fourth. Uh, you know, forget about all that resume. I just show him this video that I made for him about the start of 9-11. The only problem with it, and I can I can pass it to you, um, is that I'd love to see I it. use yeah. music that is from the last of the Mohicans. The okay. music is perfect, but I haven't paid for it, so no one can use that oh, music right, right. because it it it, it would copyrights it would be and all that. copyrights yeah. and all that stuff. Um, even though I I tell everybody that that's where the music's from. I don't you know. You know, I'm, I haven't plagiarized it and I haven't done a new thing. Sure, sure. But there's nobody can make any money at all by replaying it. So it, right. And it played just for the TACP Association. I said, this is just for the TACP Association. So you don't have to introduce me. Who cares about who LA is? I said, this will introduce me better than anything. And what I walk them through is, the role of the Ford air controller in all wars. And then I got one of those uh, hero shots, you know, the kind that um, it shows like seven guys on a ridge and, you know, the, the, the mountain part is dark and they're dark and, you know, the sunlight is up here and you think they're yeah, in yeah. full combat, you know, regalia, you know. I said, you know, American airmen came down from the skies uh, and they've always done it. And we've always done forward air control in the air, on the ground. And I said, um, we were going to do that same thing after 9-11. So we play 9-11. And I said, this is what happened. And I tell him exactly what happened with General Wald. General Wald, the 9th Air Force commander, was at the Pentagon when the Pentagon was struck. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, he was given, you know, uh, deployment, our planning orders, and all of those things were going out. So I go through that timeline, yeah. hour one, hour two, hour three. And then General Wald and his IP, Major Guns Gersten, got an F-16 uh, D model, and they were flying back to Shaw Air Force Base. And I said there was at least a two-hour period there where they were the only aviators in the sky over the continent of the United States of America. I mean, I mean, I mean wow. they were, that was it. 
Um, and I said, all this deployment stuff happens. And General Wall told someone on the staff, he goes, you've been trying to contact, you know, in the 18th century? Yeah. Well, where the hell is LA? So I put that quote in there. <laughs> where the hell is LA? You know, where is he? You know, he, he's not on duty. You know, what, what, you know, 9-11 happens, you know, where right. is the little non-rated puke, you know, guy? Where the hell right. is he? <laughs> and nobody knows, apparently, on his staff. So that word got to me or got to my staff. And um, but that got to them because they called the 332nd AEG in Kuwait and they knew I was there. Oh, OK, so they get Colonel Face Nichols and they say, hey, uh, tell L.A. He's got to talk to General Wald immediately. <laughs> All going to happen. He, 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 he's got to talk. Yeah. So. Face Nichols calls me on the range. He goes, hey, L.A. I go, hey, Face, what's up? I mean, I actually have this quote. Hey, what's up? He goes, hey, you, you need to talk to the boss. And I said something. I know it's stupid, but I said it. I go, well, which boss? You know, I got lots of bosses. You know, which, which boss? Right. Army boss here. You, you're kind of like my boss. I'm a, you know, I mean, I got all kind of bosses. The 18th Corps is my boss. You know, I mean, I, I literally have many bosses he goes hey i'm talking right, right. about the big air boss oh your wall oh okay <laughs> i'll i'll do it right now <laughs> he says i'll make the match i said okay i'm ready yeah i'm out on the range you know <laughs> okay i said colonel longoria sir he goes hey i think he said something where the hell are you Said, sir, I'm on the Udari bombing range as we speak. He goes, oh, okay. Well, we're coming. We're moving fast. Meet me at PSAB with a plan. My response is, sir, copy. PSAB, ASAP, I'll be there. And that's how the forward air control story starts for OEF. That, that part uh -huh. right there. So yeah, yeah. the reason I, I like playing it is because it tells, it, 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 it captures my boss, it, it captures the entire environment. And I said, my singular task was to get as many angels and heroes to the battlefield in Iraq and Afghanistan as quickly as possible. Yeah. I said, they, and I say, they will do the rest. I mean, that's, that's how I briefed it in the beginning. That's how I briefed it in the middle. That's how I talked about it historically. I go, that was it. Uh, that was the essence, I thought, of my job. I wasn't going to wait to be told that there was a requirement for whatever. I knew there was a requirement for it. Nobody have to tell. I said, what war planner is going to tell me something that I don't already know? I know the capabilities that these guys brought. I knew it. Uh, I had to fight battles to get them involved. Did I have to micromanage them once I got them into combat? Zero. Nothing. Not at all. They did the rest. Literally. They did yep. the entire rest of it. That doesn't mean we didn't have these little fights. You know, how many and are you going to take this and why are you moving this over here and why are you moving this here and why here and why here and why here? Constantly being second guessed by uh, some at a match com, you know, in our business to go, hey, we don't have a requirement. I go, yeah, you do. It, 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 yeah. You just don't see it yet. I'm telling you, it's a requirement. Right. And, um, and the rest literally is is history because you get everybody involved. And I just thought about all of my, I think about all of my heroes, but specifically my Silver Star heroes. What would the world have been like if we didn't have them? Not that they're heroes because they got the Silver Star. Of course they're heroes. And, and, and yes, they're heroes. But I think about what if we didn't have the Pete Donnelly, 
What if we didn't have all of these heroes? And what if they weren't in combat? Would someone else have stepped up to the plate? Maybe. Maybe. But it's not assured. With them, it's assured. Without yeah. them, yeah. it's not assured. It simply is not. Uh, and that's the difference. When I'm talking to people and they, you know, try to, a lot of authors have, you know, wanted to replay the anaconda thing and you know, what the Air Force did right, what they did wrong, what the Army did wrong, what the, you know, and everybody, everybody's got their own perspective. Every warrior who was at in a battle, I respect their perspective. Sure. That doesn't mean the next thing that they say I would agree with. I mean, someone might say, well, I was on the side of that mountain and um, and um, and this is, and this happened. Therefore, CAS sucks and the Air Force doesn't care about CAS. I go, okay, I love you. I'm with you. Right here, you're on the side of that mountain and you did this and you did that and you did this. I'm with you, brother. I'm with you. My job was to get CAS. Air power to your fight. Now, you can critique me. That's fine. I, I, I'm open for criticism. You know, I could have done things faster. I could have. I could have. I could have cheated more. I could have. I broke so many damn rules, so many different days that I can't even. I, I'm. I'm afraid one of these days they're just going to come and arrest me, or. <laughs> A list of a hundred things, and I my only response will be, I should have had two hundred. So you're not sorry for anything. Yeah. I'm not. Not only am I not sorry, I wish I would have done it more. <laughs> if I had more tack peas to put into this fight, if I had more Shaq Boshans and Pete Donnellys and Don Tharps and Byron Reisner, and you know, I mean, I, I would have put them in. Um, yeah. All of them were like, you know, put me in coach. I mean, all of them. Like, you know, yeah. Like, our business is a volunteer business. You know, I mean, that's. What we I know, right. Um, that's the kind of people those guys are that would just, they, they can't wait to go right. for sure. Uh, yeah. But those stories uh, about those individuals are the things that make, um, you know, the first part of OEF and then OIF uh, more juicy, uh, I, I think. You yeah, know, you know, besides just reading yeah. some of the history, although um, the more you learn about uh, John Chapman, you go, wow, that's uh, it, it's 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 so heroic. I can't I, I, I can't even have words to describe it. Right. But I know that mentality is in all of these warriors. Mm. I mean. The Mark Hurst and the Kevin Vance's, you know, and the Tim Stamies, yeah. uh, and the Steve Tomats, yeah. the Eric Brandenburgs, you know, the Jim Fairchilds, you know, that's in a, a right. commander that's in the, he, he wasn't in our business yet, but he's in a strike eagle, and they're trying to strafe with a strike eagle, which is kind of weird anyway. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's literally kind of right. weird. Uh, responding to all of the danger close stuff. Everything in that thing was danger close. Everything, every bomb drop, every yeah. single thing. Yep. You know, danger close is supposed to be that kind of unique thing that we do when, when well, you know, it's the last thing that we we may or may not do, but it's supposed to be a little special. Well, that was all. Everything was danger close. Everything. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think uh, Kevin Vance had even fired personally from his own weapon over 200 rounds into the enemy. And if he'd had more, he would have shot more. I mean, like. <laughs> right, right. Um, and he was the pointy end guy for Captain Self, the Army Ranger, who was there. Yeah. Which, uh, another story for my young officer friends is that when you. When you write a combat decoration on a hero, it's the greatest thing you're ever going to do. You're going to tell it like it was. That's true. You're always going to do that. Yep. But you have to 
listen to multiple uh, data sources, if you will. And you have to make some kind of assessment. Uh, and it's not just the number of adjectives that you throw in to uh, your writing, okay? Adjectives are great. Uh, verbs and nouns and shit that happen, that's much better. Yeah. It, it, it is. I mean, I, I don't want to be gruesome, but, you know, 15 enemy kill, you know, this tank taken out, this, this, I mean, it, it all has to be in uh, a decoration. The circumstances involved is what makes it heroic, that's true. But for the young officers who get an opportunity to write a combat decoration on a great American NCO is um, an honor. It's not a burden. It's an honor. So when I think about all those guys, I go, God damn. <laughs> um, and my other goal was to, I told, now this time General Mosley had swapped out with General Wall when we started having all of these decoration boards. And before you get a decoration, even though your commanders support you and write it, it goes to a big board. That's the way we did it in the Air Force. And yeah. you got a lot of colonels that represent multiple weapon systems and all kinds of things. And yeah. um, sometimes you debate these things. Joe Mosley made me a promise, and he was a great commander, by the way, the greatest CFAC I've ever worked for, ever, and I've worked for many. Um, he said, what do you want, L.A.? I said, I want permanent membership on every decoration board. And I made sure, I'm not trying to virtue signal here, but it's, it was the honor of my life. Every combat controller, every tactic, every combat weather, that, uh, and every PJ. I said, we need to make distinctions between doing great combat meritorious service stuff and a valorous part. Yeah, and that separates exactly at the Bronze Star level. There's a combat, great achievement, in combat, intense environment, but it's really the highest meritorious achievement you can get in combat. And then there are their Valor Awards. Now, the Valor Awards start off a little bit lower. They can start off, you know, a Valor Award can be at a at now an achievement or a combination medal. But really, the, sure. the important Valor Awards start at the Bronze Star with Valor. And then Silver Star, right. and then the Service Cross, and then the Medal of Honor. With, in the flying business, the, the Air Medal or the Distinguished Flying Cross. And so I sat on eight consecutive decoration boards, the only Air Force colonel to sit on all eight in a row. Wow. And I will just say this. I've heard a lot of, you know, things, good, bad, or different, or whatever, and I, I don't, it doesn't bother me. Uh, I made sure that every special warfare airman was appropriately decorated. Now, in the case of um, our most decorated individuals, and I sat in the discussion with JSOC. I know who said what, who did what, when they said it, how they said it, what they said. Um, and all the JSOC commanders at the time of the original meeting was that no one was going to get higher than a service cross. So the Navy Cross, Army Distinguished Service Cross, or Air Force Cross. And that you will see uh, their awards in the Air Force decorated that way. And yeah. then the Navy kind of changed. They did a reevaluation. Uh, the Army did a reevaluation and didn't make any change. The Navy didn't make a change. Which should have prompted an appropriate discussion, and it did. And I'm so proud of the United States Air Force as a corporate entity, and that's multiple service chiefs 
the chiefs of our Air Force, and the secretaries of the Air Force. That we should be proud of all of them that helped this process work the way it's supposed to work. And because John Chapman is an American hero. And all of those people who Definitely. received an Air Force Cross are American heroes too. Um, yep. To include um, our PJ, uh, Cunningham, uh, who was in Anaconda and received the Air Force Cross. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, those are big deals. And for me, it was always hard because if I had an Army commander that would call me and tell me, that they want to write the Army commander, not, not my ALO or not my squadron, Air Force squadron commander. They, they said, no, L.A., um, your guys are hero. I'm going to write them uh, Silver Star packages. I said, okay. You tell me what I need to do to help you. And thank you, sir, for being a great commander. Yeah. Some of those discussions with the Army went like that. Some of the discussions with the Army were different, as you well can imagine. Yeah, the yeah. battalion commander told me, for example, that they didn't need the Air Force even before OIF, as we're about to now launch from Kuwait into Iraq. They said, I, I don't need right, the Air right. Force. I said, well, let me tell you, you you're going to tell me that one time. Because yeah. the second time I moved that TACP element out, and I don't have enough, so I'll send them somebody else. Yeah. That's going to happen. I don't have time for bullshit. I don't have time for Washington, D.C. games. I don't have time for um, your, you know, Army is this, Air Force is this. I literally don't have time for that bullshit, and I'm not going to listen to it. And neither are my heroes going to have to listen to that. I'll move them out. And if you don't think yeah. I can, Check to see if they're still there. I mean, <laughs> that's how I thought I had to be. Some of those commanders, yeah. and I won't mention their names, there are only a few, didn't want my TACP. Yeah, they were stupid, literally. And some yeah. of those Army commanders were the greatest commanders that I've ever seen in my life. So when people says, well, the Army is this way, or the Army is this way, I go, it depends. It depends on that commander. Does. And some are great and some are not. Um, so now those are the stories that you just don't, I, you, you normally can't get that out of the, the normal history. Uh, I'm right. happy to share it. And I don't want to do it in a way to see, you know, how great uh, L.A. was. But L.A. had to do a lot of to get to my heroes. <laughs> yeah. Since that time, yeah. they don't need L.A., worth frip frap because they got it they did it they're the heroes i mean that it's just a, it's just a fact yeah it's like um uh that's why i love them that's why i love them all i i do uh and people say well how did you get promoted to general i i don't have a clue how i got promoted to general i don't uh i would never recommend this exact path that i took i wouldn't even know how to recommend it yeah, I don't know how to recommend. But if you surround yourself with great people constantly in every assignment, for whatever reason, I was surrounded by great people. And I mean great people, heroes, smart people, really smart people. And it's just like when I did my DARPA thing. I mean, really? I'm sitting in a group with PhDs? Uh, there is no way. No way. I could ever match MIT wits with these PhDs. No way. Um, And I listened to everything they had to say, everything. And I wanted to know what they had to say. So that's a privilege when you get to listen to people. like that. That, 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 That's that's never a burden. That's a privilege. That's why I feel privileged. Uh, Every day I feel privileged. to. Do you think that like you that people saw something in you that we have, we all see that you have a, you have such a different perspective on things and 
like we talked about this before that you, you don't, you don't pull any punches. Like you, you give people the straight dope on whatever subject we're talking about. You're, you're going to tell them exactly how you feel and the truth that as you see it. And I think that's probably where these people, these organizations that, you know, where you, you, you know, humbly say, I don't know how I got there. I think that's how they saw, I think they saw something in you. Like we need to get that perspective in here so we can get the full picture before we start making a decision on these national level, you know, decision-making processes or whatever, the, whatever the, you guys are doing. But yeah, I think you, I think your unique perspective was exactly what they were looking for, for sure. Well, now General Casey told me something like that. And when he promoted me, cause it was army General Casey who was, uh, uh-huh. who, who would become the army chief of staff, but was um, running the Iraq war uh, at the time that I worked for him. Because I was the commanding general for the Joint Task Force to capture, kill high value targets. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. That seems I don't know anything about that. I'd like. And to, that was here. Here, I want to yeah. be honest with you. It was an intelligence organization. Okay. So now I'm just yeah. saying, if you took an informal poll, call all the fighter pilots in the Air Force that know me, <laughs> and say, "Hey, LA is getting an intelligence job." Okay, number one, they'd be rolling on the floor uh, laughing. <laughs> it's just the truth, yeah. and my feelings aren't hurt by it, because sure, they sure. were equally surprised when I called a couple of my fighter pilot dudes and told them, "Hey, I'm going to be the guy. I'm going to be the guy who decides where Air Force Cyber Command, when we develop it, where it's going to go." I had that special assignment at Air Combat Command. They were, laughing. Right, right, right. they were laughing about that because they go, L.A., uh, didn't you just learn how to use the Internet a week ago? Yeah, yeah. But, and, and now you're deciding where Cyber Command is going to go? I mean, they thought it was funny. Okay, so so the backdrop yeah, yeah. is it is kind of funny. I mean, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, funny in a sad way and funny in a happy way, but funny <laughs> nonetheless. So General Casey said, because I told him, I said, sir. Um, uh, thank you. For, I, I said I'm gonna I'm gonna work my ass off. I said, but to be honest with you, I'm a, I'm an operator. I'm, I'm a, I know in the Air Force I'm a non-rated puke. I said, but in Army speak, I'm an operator. I mean, I, I, I'm a, I'm a grunt. And he goes, no, 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 I got that. He goes, that's why I wanted you. Yeah. I got a lot of smart intelligence people. He says, but you're going to hunt down, capture or kill these high value targets. And we're going to give you all these resources to do that. Um, I want an operator. And I want you to wade through the, through the literally the maze of stuff that you have to wade through. Uh, All, all int, all sources of intelligence, uh, whether they're, electronic or human or, you know, where they got them from sure. the big sky, the little sky, the, wherever we get right, right, or right. electronically, uh, you have to wade all of that together to find basically, you know, the, remember the, the card deck of bad guys uh, that we were after? Yep. Yeah. Those are my targets. I had a list okay. of about 50 to 100 uh, that would rotate people that would support them and be related to them on these these wiring diagrams that you know we see now are the way that the government kind of can spy on us <laughs> is that <laughs> yeah. we were doing that in OIF because okay. if you got on a cell phone we could track it if you just had the cell phone on we could track it if you took the battery out, we could still track you. If you ever came up wow. on the net and said something about something, we could track you. And we know who you talk to, and we know the three people that they talk to, and the 16 people that they talk to, and the 64 people that they talk to, and the you know, and it goes from there. Sure, sure. So my biggest challenge in that particular job was 
listening to all of the great expertise, which I got daily, I mean, hour by hour. But I wanted to get back to the original information, if it were human, let's say. I wanted the original, where did this come from? Who said what to whom? And I did cause a little wave. Uh, I, that's probably why I never would get another intelligence shot. <laughs> I got a little away because I said, it seems to me that our entire structure is based on, I don't want to give you the number, but a handful of original sources. And then we all talk about that source and we build these elaborate things, but the number of original sources hasn't changed. We've somehow inflated, not 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 by line or doing something wrong. We we've just inflated naturally one report that follows on another report that talks about this report that talks about this report, and we call that in the social media business. It's like this weird piling on, and we're exaggerating claims because. We continue to repeat things that people have said about what people have said about what people have said. And we've already talked about what people have said and not about the real origin of the intelligence. Oh, uh, yeah. And so I, in other words, we have self-reported ourselves through the wickets. Okay. And so I kind of forced Fed. And I will say this, the, the one person that probably would have agreed to me was uh, General Michael Flynn. He probably would have agreed with me. At okay. the time, at the time, he didn't. Uh, I won't okay. go into a lot of details because sure, we're sure. not on each other's Christmas card list. So <laughs> right, I, right. I just leave it as it is. Um, okay. So, but I said, this is crazy. It's a house of cards. <laughs> it literally is a house of cards and I'm looking for more meat down here. I need more meat. I cannot yeah. target. If you're going to target uh, a high value target, just generally speaking, mm -hmm. you need a lot of substance that you, you got to have that background because nothing you'll not, you'll not be able to sort out different information that you receive. If you, sure. if you don't have a substantial understanding, uh, and a lot of smart people to have that, and we need that. But you also can't target unless you have the highest fidelity surveillance that you can make the entire system point at right there. And if you're wrong by an hour, like at a particular location, you fail. Yeah. You know, if they go from one location to another location to another location, and let's just say you're 30 minutes behind, yeah, it's yeah. failure. So I, that's about as far as I can go and all of the structure associated with it. And the other thing that sure. we did that was very important that I thought, I spent a time in Lyon, France, um, to put a red notice out on each of our high value targets. In other words, through the international, through Interpol, uh, you know, the international policing organization. Yep. Basically, it's, they're a huge database. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> and I wanted a red notice on every high value target um, that we were tracking. Because we couldn't, you never knew of them. Were they in Afghanistan? Were they in Iraq? Were they in Syria? Were they in Israel, were they in the United States? Were they, you know, now the problem with the United States was uh, complicated, um, and depending on the, the the third country where they may have been, the uh, levels of complication rose. Or and if they made it back to the United States, it was very complicated, and I couldn't touch them. Ah, okay. Like that seems odd. It seems like that'd be the easiest place to get them if you came back to the states. Yeah, well, I handed off. I guess that would be to other agencies. Did a lot of hand off. Okay. Okay. I handed off to National gotcha. Mission Element. 
that okay. I will describe. And I handed off to other three letter agencies that, that they were all working for me. So, you know, I had, I had FBI people, I had CIA people, I had NSA people, I had people on, on my interagency staff, if you will. Sure. And when I needed to make an official targeting handoff, I just, and they handed it off. As long as you know, General Casey okay. knew, and, you know, I mean, the commanders knew, you know, of course, we, you know, okay. they all knew. Um, I did get in trouble one time uh, flying to Syria because I thought I was going to catch a guy and I was a little worried about the system that he would have gotten lost. So I said, I'm getting on that 130. I'm going. I'm taking this element. Uh, we're going to pick him up. We're going to bring him back. Nothing's going to bad. It's going to happen to him. We're going to turn him over to the Iraqis. I uh, torqued off ambassador. <laughs> that that act of me flying into Syria, they had to do a, a whole investigation uh, of me. Was it because you didn't alert the Syrians that you were coming? No, no, we had, uh, we had done all of those notifications. Uh, I, I wish it would have okay. been just as simple, but the one person that was out of the loop temporarily was the ambassador, the American ambassador. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, everybody, like, like everybody in the world was in the loop, except for the ambassador. And I was a little upset, frankly, and I won't get into any names with the with the, the CENTCOM liaison to that ambassador because they had all the information. In other words, they, yeah. they didn't pass it to the ambassador. Oh, okay. So it's like I arrive and the ambassador goes, I don't know who the you are and why do you think you, you know, and who's responsible for this? And, you know, nobody ever likes my answer, you know, because I go, well, I'm responsible for it. You know, I, I don't yeah. like dine out bosses. I, I, I've just never done that. Well, well I want to, sure. I don't want the name of who, de who determined who got on that airplane. Me, you're looking at. It. Like, oh no, 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 no! I want to. What? I, that's who determined who got on that airplane right there, sitting on that ramp. Okay. And told the crew. The crew's not responsible. The crew did all the right things. Yeah. yeah. I said I told the crew. I get you know. I want the name. Well, you got my name, Mike Longor. Yeah, I give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, I mean, you, you can tell how that personnel, I mean, it sounds good, but, you know, at some point in time, it's, 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 it's like a, a career ending kind of thing. I don't know if it was or not. Yeah. I, I'm four ranks ahead of where I thought I would ever be anyway. <laughs> right. So right. it's all gravy I, now. Anyways, the gravy but... anyway. Like, so I go, I'm not going to change my personality. I'm not going to change who I am. Um, sure. I'm a dedicated and loyal American and I will fight for this country anywhere at any time. I mean, it kind of speaks to what we were talking about before about the bureaucracy. Like that guy's his only, uh, his only concern was who told you to be there. It's like, not, not why are you there? Hey, can I help you now that you right. are here? It was like, who told, you know, like, once you focus on the right part of the story, man, that's, you know, there's a reason why I'm here and let's get this done. And then we can talk about all your other crap. You right. Know? And I would have gone through any hoop that he wanted me to. It's just that I had a C-130 on the ramp, blades turning. And uh, now at that time we were blades turning. In Lebanon. We were blades turning in Lebanon, but we had to fly over Syrian airspace. And which made it complicated because the Syrian shot at us, you know, and then they stopped. But, you know, so that's true. That made it more complicated. Uh, but yeah. everybody knew that was the route we were taking. I mean, everybody, like mm -hmm. the government of Syria knew. Like everybody knew. Okay. I mean, this, it wasn't like we were doing some kind of secret mission. Well, it, it was. I mean, the mission itself probably was, but the fact that you were flying there in that route or right. over them, you know, everybody knew yeah, that. Yeah, everybody knew. <laughs> so, but, you know, then I, I then we created the wing, the 93rd AGAL. So I go, yeah. I, I don't care if I ever get promoted again. I mean, this is the wing. This is the wing that I wanted to create. We created. Right. This is the wing that I wanted. I said, now there will be a wing commander job for all of these great ailers like the Shaq Beauchesnes and the Pete Donnellys and 
all of these great people that are going to come after, uh, this is going to be their wing. That, yeah. that, that's how I saw it. Um, and so I, I know this sounds like it's so self-serving, but I said, I didn't need to get promoted. Yeah. I created that wing and I loved everybody in it. And so I, I know it sounds funny, but I, I, I literally did not need anything else uh, out of my Air Force career. I think I could have helped in other ways. It was further than I ever thought probably ever should have uh, gone. And I love my wife. And I love my kids. But they would tell yeah. you the same thing. I mean, doesn't mean they don't love me, but they would say. No, no, for sure. I, uh, you defied the odds. Let's put yeah, it that way. For sure. So. A couple, t- couple times. I, th- I think so. So. Um, yeah. But I look at them as opportunities. You know, you get an opportunity, Definitely. you run with it. Uh, you you do you do with it and um, not to say that I don't have personal and individual failures I mean you know, like I said I'm not the uh, smartest guy I mean, you know you're never going to see my name on a top graduate uh, you know uh, list uh, anywhere but um, I'd like to think I don't know although I think about the the combat losses that we've had in my units um, and I think about them all the time, but we didn't have a failure. We didn't fail. Now, why didn't we fail? Well, that's because the people who were doing the mission, it's because they didn't fail. So I don't want to take, I don't, I don't want to steal their valor or their expertise or their work because they're the ones that made it successful. That's true. I benefited from it. That's true. Uh, but people have asked me, just like, hey, when you jumped into Panama a long time ago, when you were a young captain and just turned major, um, what was the biggest thing that drove you? I go, well, well, the biggest thing that drove me is I didn't want to screw things up on Rio Hato Airfield because I was in charge of running Rio Hato Airfield. We made a combat jump into it. We had great TACP uh, and great combat controllers and great PJs uh, all working. Uh, we made a combat jump with the, with the Army Rangers. Uh, it would be the second and third bats. First bat was at Torrios de Cumin. So we had two, and we had the regimental talk, uh, regimental commander with us. And when I jumped out, I was like three spots from him. So, and he was a great guy. That was uh, Colonel, Colonel at the time, Kernan, who had become General Kernan, uh, one of those great American Army commander leaders, you know, without question. The hyperness that I had was always about airplanes on a runway getting mortared. More than anything else, I have to tell you, that scared the shit out of me <laughs> because. I can imagine, yeah. Not because I was worried about my own safety. It wasn't. It wasn't that. I go. So if people said, "So you were the airfield commander when there was a C-130 that had just done this heroic stuff by getting beans, bullets, or personnel, or whatever," and before they could take off, the enemy pops them with a mortar, and now you got a big fireball. So congratulations. Captain or Major Longoria, congratulations. That's what happened on your airfield. It drove every decision that I would make. I said, whatever, we're not going to have a Desert One on this airfield at Rio Hato. Um, 12th Air Force Commander was mad at me, I think, for a little time. Calm Alf at the time, Commander Airlift Forces. Uh, was mad. That was the 21st Air Force commander. Because I told one the normal 130s convention that would come in later. I said, "Hey, um, this is engine running offload only." And I said, "I said, are you prepared to get your pallets off that airplane within a minute? If you're not, you cannot get a landing clearance." 
Okay, that got all the way back to 21st Air Force. And I had people going, well, who in the hell does he think he is? We're going to fire that son of a bitch. We're going to shoot him. We're going to do something. We're going to, you know. Yeah. Who, who is he? What is he? He's a non-rated puke sitting on that damn airfield, uh, you know, saying he's going to protect it. I mean, it just, it doesn't stop. And I got, I got a lot of grief for it. Um, Was this during or after? Or so the original uh, combat jump. As far as like the grief you were getting, like, were you getting like transmissions from people like you better? Oh, well, the 12th Air Force commander. Or... Well, no, the, the, my conversation with the actual 12th Air Force commander over the radio was basically it was the biggest battle damage assessment that's ever been given in the history of battle damage assessment. <laughs> so the 117s were dropping on uh, Battalion 2000 um, dormitory or whatever, you know, a little building. The yeah. 117s and a great combat control officer who planned this, that's John Corn, who is who mentored me when I was very young at Hobart, um, had been in on the Desert One mission in Iran, but you know became an officer, and he was the lead planner for the 117 mission to go against that Rio Hato target. Although he wasn't jump in with us at Rio Hato, he was just planning it. He jumped into Torrios to Cumin. Um, but the plan was, and the plan changed, that they would drop not on the building, but offset from the building by about, I, I would guess, about 100 meters. That changes everything. <laughs> when you don't hit the building intentionally, you just yeah, create yeah. a big crater. Okay, well, your battle damage. Well, what is the battle damage assessment supposed to be? Yeah. I mean, I mean, what, yeah, okay, exactly. so we provided no structural part to the battle damage assessment. And a young captain I had working for me, Jeff Schuldheis, great American, who'd been a PJ and we'd made him a combat control officer. So we had all the right credentials and very experienced. And he was an air traffic control officer before that. Um, he says, okay, he says, I said, well, measure the crater. He says, okay, it's about, you know, 20 by, you know, 42. I said, okay, how, how deep is it? Uh, he goes, well, it's about, I'm standing in, it's about, uh, it's about, you know, uh, at 1.14 feet, but for the most part, it's about like, you know, 12 feet or whatever. I mean, yeah. that's actually a big crater. I mean, that's not a small crater. So right, right. I go, okay. I, so I put a little of that data in the battle damage and said, just a little bit of that. Cause, you know, we're still getting shot at. We're still in, we're like, yeah. um, and sure, why sure. they wanted the BDA for the 117s right then, I, I, I didn't know. But, you know, they're the bosses. I'm going to give it to them. The 117s are attacking yeah. and they're gone. I mean, the things right, right, that are right. going to reattack are AC-130 gunships, little birds, you know, I mean, you know, I, I, yeah, yeah. anyway, we were providing it. And so I put, I said, I said, besides that data, I said it was combat effective because Battalion 2000 ran to the hills. So in other words, whatever you did, now, if you wanted to kill them, no. Okay, we didn't kill them. Sure. Uh, did they stay and fight? No, they didn't stay. Now, other groups stayed and fought. But those guys in that yeah. dormitory or that building, they didn't stay and fight. So I think the <laughs> F-117 crowd was elated because it sent a little data, crater size, combat effective, Battalion 2000, now – one click into the hills. Yeah. And man, I don't know why that made the 12th Air Force commander mad. <laughs> it was the worst BDA he'd ever gotten. I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, yeah. 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 I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but remember, even as important as that was, wasn't important 
is I didn't want to lose an airplane on that damn airfield. Sure. Yeah, you're, you got you had your priorities. So the biggest sure. problem in the beginning was um, one of the MC 130s uh, lost an engine, and they had to do a three engine uh, takeoff. Okay. Okay. Now that's a big deal. I got it, but it's also combat. But they had to get permission to take off from someone not at the airfield, like 12th Air Force or, you know, I go, so the air crew tells me this and I go, okay. Um, and they didn't need me to do anything because they were talking SATCOM, you know, they, they had their yeah, own yeah. Uh, connection. They did get the approval, but they were about to be told by me I didn't, I didn't do it. It was about to be take off or I will shoot you because <laughs> you are a mortar magnet. Okay. I actually did not say that to anyone <laughs> over the radio. Uh, um, but I told one of my NCOs and he goes, oh, shit, sir, no, please don't, please don't say that. <laughs> Please don't say that. I'm trying to keep you out of jail, sir. Please don't do that. Like, okay. So I didn't do that. But they took off. Yeah, yeah. And I was happy until it was 24 hours later. We started circling in the Seventh Infantry Division, and uh -huh. they came in by conventional airlift mostly. But okay. you know, they're coming in. And basically, they're running off the airplane. And if they had a vehicle, it, it was off. So they were no right, problem. Right. However, my worst fear came to be that runway got mortared exactly where a 130 had just taken off. So I'm lucky by maybe two and a half minutes. I mean, obviously they had it dialed in. I mean, they were trying to hit yeah, it. Yeah, they, were they, were the, they weren't very good. And um, now the problem I had with my TACP heroes, you know, you got Marty Klukas there. You got um, you got great people. Jazz Erickson. Yeah, there. oh, Jazz, yeah. And Jazz knows I get jazzed up when I talk about <laughs> I go, I love my TACP. I love them all. I love them all. But I'm a controller. Not a combat controller, but the my control paradigm normally includes an airfield. I say you just can't call in any weapon system like an A thirty seven, okay, and attack a target in the aerodrome that is the airfield without me <laughs> going yes or no, cleared. Right, right. Not clear. You can do that out in the jungle. You can do that in the right. desert. You can do that everywhere else. I want you to do that. But this airfield. Well, we use AC 130s. I said, well, the difference with an AC 130 is that the weapon system is different. And they are almost perfect for jungle stuff. You can see who's who. You, if once you get them identified, you know, at the time, your know, options were 20, 40, 105. Well, we weren't going to use a 105, and we didn't in Rio Hato. We did at La Comedancia, yeah. you know, in downtown Panama City, and that was a beautiful thing. But not at Rio Hato. Different weapons require different environments, different situations. Different, different requires different. And the best platforms that were considered close air support were little birds age sixes and gunships but the last thing i needed frankly was an a37 tell me how the a37 is going to know what to attack well we'll throw smoke really in a jungle this close how does that work tell me you're the expert tell me how that works Ah, uh, it doesn't they're guessing. I got it. You're guessing. I 
Can't have that at my airfield. It's always kind of an asshole. I don't, I don't know. So Jazz always thought, and I loved him. But, you know, the best, uh, Frankie, the best weapon against a, a mortar is counter mortar right then in, in a jungle well, at that mm. particular time. Not that we couldn't have used some other asset later or some, you know, if we had broken off some differentiation or we knew that some battalion was coming in vehicles, you know, and they were coming on a road that you could see the all American highway and they were on the highway. Oh my sure, God. Sure. Yeah. Bring those eight thirty sevens. Have them, have them go right down that, that highway and blow the shit out of everything. Cause we're not there. Right. Yeah. I want you to do that. And it's not close to my airfield. I mean, I can actually be landing the right. C one thirty. That eight thirty seven can be strafing the crap out of that convoy on the highway. And we're all happy. Right, right. But when you get it uh, uh, mixed up. That could have been catastrophic. I was, I was driven by fear. Yeah, could... Fear of screwing up. Sure, sure. That's, um, and I, I don't want a damn award for that. I, I just don't want to be the, you know, on the History Channel, you know, this is what happened at the Battle of Rio Hato. Right. Know, uh, yeah, that's. Yeah, I, I was trying to avoid the History Channel stuff rather than uh, being on the History Channel. So uh, I don't know. I don't know of any war story, any juicy uh, war stories like other ones. I'm sure there are, but um, I've either forgotten them or you know could go to jail if I told them. So. <laughs> well, wait. What was that one? Um, what was it something about Pakistan? Didn't you? Oh, didn't you do something about oh, yeah. like okay. you, didn't you get a little scrape in Pakistan yeah, or that something? That is another problem area. So when we were transporting in the first part of OEF prisoners that we would take on the battlefield, we had a system that if they were collected in Afghanistan, we'd bring them to Bagram Air Base. Everybody knew that there was a a one-star army general in charge of that whole operation. Good friend of mine uh, that had been the Delta commander was a good guy too. And I liked him because we became friends when I was at US SOCOM with the sink because he had a special assistant job and I had a special assistant job. So he was a general, I was a colonel. So, but he still considered me a friend. So it's okay. Okay. And he had that operation. And then, We'd learned that there were other prisoners in Pakistan. So the complication there was um, different authorities for flying into and out of Pakistan, if you well can imagine. They had mm -hmm. different rules for weapons you could bring and weapons you couldn't bring. They actually had a lot of rules. Well, okay. we were going to be compliant with all those things. But I also developed a great relationship because I was the land component commander, which was C flick. You know, there, there's a C fact and there's a C flick. I was a ranking <laughs> officer at the C flick um, and developed a great relationship with the director of mobility forces at the C fact. So, in other words, the big general that was in charge of all the airlift in that theater. and the inter theater work that would come from the big jets, you know, C-17, C-5 into theater. So the Dermot 4 had that responsibility. And I had to talk to the Dermot 4, even though, yes, I was a cast guy. Yes, a controller. Yes, airspace. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. But I'm also, in the back of my mind, I I'm a mobility guy. I spent a, lo a lot of time at MAC headquarters. I know how the airlift system works. Um, and as a combat controller, I supported nothing but airlift almost. Yeah, yeah. So it's not as if I didn't understand any of that. The Dermot 4 and I struck up a relationship because he knew I understood this and he understood that. And so we could talk daily. Because the biggest problems that we had with the sea flick was not on CAS or what I would call ground directed interdiction. 
of the first part. Mm -hmm. It was on airlift. And everybody was unhappy with airlift. You know, how much do we got? When are we going to get it? We need this here. We need this here. We need this here. We need this here. So I was on the phone with Dermop 4 probably a dozen times a day, every day. Like, it never stopped. Never. Yeah. It, it, it literally never stopped. And people thought, well, I, like I'm an airlift guy. You know, so... An airlift guy actually comes in. He's a young uh, captain. And he says, um, I said, wow, uh, an Air Force guy. Um, wh where do you work? He says, I work for the, uh, I work for the four, you know, the logging guy, the Army colonel. I said, well, what are you working on? Um, he says, I'm working on a briefing that explains how the Air Force is not meeting the airlift requirement for the Army. I said, say that one more time. You're working on what briefing? You're working on a briefing. I mean, I'm answering questions a dozen times a day. You're working on a briefing that says the Air Force is not supporting the Army? Oh, yes. I said, hmm. <laughs> well, Captain, stop working on that now. That's an order. <laughs> Have the courtesy of going to that Army colonel and saying, Colonel Longoria, that Air Force guy over there says, I don't work for you and that I have to leave this office right now and go to his office. I'm going to tell him that. I said, now I'll tell him, but you go do that. So before I did that, I called Dermot Four. I said, and he goes, what? What did you do? And he goes, I said, I did what I just said, and he goes, oh, that's great. That's exactly that. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. So we really developed a really good relationship on what my role was going to be at that land component headquarters, uh -huh. because that's why I said I had multiple bosses when a boss would want me. So I was the 18th um, Corps Commander's ALO. Okay. I worked for the CFAC in war. Ninth Air Force commander on paper back home. Yeah. By order, I was assigned to be the liaison to the land component commander army, which is third army back home. So okay. third army commander, the land component commander, the 18th Airborne Corps commander, the CFAC the 9th Air Force commander back home and the soft three star because my soft tech P supported Rangers and special forces. Right, right. I was a senior guy. So when I put this on a briefing slide, <laughs> I have three army three star bosses, one Air Force three star boss. I mean, that's at a minimum. So that's yeah, yeah. four three-star bosses. And anybody asked me, hey, the boss is calling. I'd have to ask them, yeah, it's like, <laughs> which boss? Tell me which boss. Right, right. But the long and short of that, I had a great working relationship with the Dermot Four. He knew I understood the airlift system. And at the time, we actually had 18th Air Force, which is the operating arm of the Military Airlift Command. You know, I mean, it's everything revolves around that. We didn't have 21st or 22nd anymore. They were different entities. It was the 18th Air Force. So I understood the airlift system, uh, and he could confine me. And so when I gave him a heads up that we had prisoners in Pakistan, he goes, oh, shit. He says, well, I'm going to have to put crews against that to go pick them up in Pakistan transport them across the country dividing line between Afghanistan and Pakistan and fly them into Bagram and so that they could be put into the facility where we uh, talk to them. Correct. Um, and he said, uh, I, 
I don't know if I have any crews that can transport that because I said, it's actually a difficult task. I just want to think about the task. The first, and I said, because I was telling him, he says, how do you know? I says, oh, sir, I've been doing this for a long time. He says, okay. I said, you will get these prisoners. They will be of all ages, shapes and sizes. They will all be in man dresses. And they will shit and piss all the way up to the airplane, in the airplane, back off the airplane. You are responsible for floor loading this, I'm assured, because we have protocols for how to floor load them. I said, but if there's an aircraft emergency or anything, I mean, I'm walking him through all of the difficulties in planning. He goes, oh, my God. He goes, (laughs) Go meet those crews. Give them as much sensitivity training, not sensitivity training, but make them as sensitive to these issues as possible. Tell them the best protocols yeah. to use for safety of aircraft, safety of the passengers, for emergency purposes, etc. You, you got it. The crews have to file all the right flight plans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everything has to be deconflicted in the AOC. I said, yeah, yeah, we got that. He says, can you do that? I go, yeah, I, we're not, so, okay. So he got me a C-21. It lands in Kuwait, picks me up, takes me down to Sieb. That's where the, uh, the C-130 crews are. So I okay. them, everything like this. But the problem is I have to leave my long gun, there, my AR-15, my GAL-5, basically. Oh, yeah. And I was supposed to leave my... Pistol, I said, I'm not going, I'm not going into combat without something to shoot at people. I'm, no. Right, so I had to leave that there. And I hid my uh, pistol. And we fly into Smart. Pakistan. And the prisoners are not there. Now we have liaison officers that are working at high levels. There was a general, a one star, and um, an Air Force major, I think. And so I, I went to them and they said, we don't, we, don't, we don't know where they are. I said, well, this was supposed to be, you know, a simple transload. Yeah. Get them in the airplane, wrap them up. Everybody safe. Yep. Yep. The flight to Bagram is an hour if that. I mean, it's not long. And yeah. Mission done. Over with. Complete. Crews go home. I go back. You know, everything. It's done. It's it's, it's done. Okay. Yeah, Nothing yeah. ever works that way. And so my problem was I did exactly what I said I never would do. Um, I was a group commander. Uh, and I was by myself. Now, I don't mean alone like – I mean I was alone in that no one worked for me. Negotiate with the aircraft commander where I think you need to do this. And, you know, I didn't want to keep saying to the aircraft commander – Hey, you want me to call the Dermop Four? You know, I, I, I could have done that. But that's just not the way I, just not the way I, I do anything. You know, I explain to people sure, sure. what we got to do, why we got to do it, why it's important, and I go, what authorities do you need? If you don't have some authority, I will get you some authority to do something. Like Dermop Four says, you, we need to take off with <laughs> uh, two hours. Okay, so how can I now help you? And talk, work with the load masters and all those kinds. Yeah, yeah. And I got the cops assigned to the crew. Their job, and as I told them, your job, you only have one job, protect that air crew at all costs. Someone, anyone comes towards the cabin, shoot them. Deadly force is authorized. <laughs> no discussion, no nothing. I don't care who it is. You protect the crew at all costs. And that was the MAC protocol. It's not yeah. a, you know, it's a very simple protocol. Now, you still have to worry about safety of flight issues and all those other kinds of things. All right, so the air crew commanders were good. It's not that they weren't, you know, but I had to explain each time. But nobody worked for me. Like, <laughs> no one worked for me. Uh, my staff did back at the Seaflake headquarters, and they were battle tracking me. Where are you now? So, you know, and I, I would... 
Now I'm in C. Now, now, now you're going to Pakistan. Oh, the commander's in Pakistan. I, you know, and they would have to brief the land component commander, you know, where I was because I actually worked. Yeah. Where's LA now? You know, you know, where's Waldo? Uh, kind of thing. Uh, but the prisoners were not there. I had no idea. I had no intelligence. I had no idea where they were. I, I hadn't thought. Oh my god! And to be honest with you, I hadn't thought. I hadn't thought through that. Never expected. To be in that yeah, it didn't dawn on you they wouldn't be there. They were supposed to be there. So I mean, I, I didn't expect it. It just. Um, yeah. So I go okay, and I asked this Air Force major. I wish I could remember his name, but anyway, he's a good guy. I said, "Can I go there?" He goes, "I don't know." I go, "You don't know?" <laughs> I said, "So." Who I said, who just show me the Pakistani Army Air Force? Any who do I need to talk to to see if I can get to the prisoners because I want to get these prisoners back to this airplane and I want to get out of here. And we find a Pakistani Army guy and goes, uh, Oh, yeah, uh, I'll drive you. <laughs> I go, This is wonderful, just ask questions. And you get uh, you get answers. Yeah. So now the major doesn't come with me because uh, he goes, no, we don't really go out. We, uh, we have to stay here. I said, well, whatever. Uh -huh. So I get in the car and great, let's go. Uh, once again, no intelligence brief. I'm not. I am. I'm embarrassed to say that uh, for a while I really didn't know what I was. I said. I'm now traveling with a Pakistani army uh, in a vehicle. I'm going to go to prisoners. I have no idea where I am, where I'm going. I know where I just came from, the airfield, so I think I can make it back here. Um, but that's about it. And I started thinking about that as oh I was God. getting to this location. Oh, yeah. Man, I really hope, <laughs> I really hope Nothing happens. I can, I can yeah. honestly say I really said that to myself. I really hope because nothing's going to happen. Um, yeah. The Pakistanis yeah. have control. This is about 17 miles, maybe 20, 17, 20 miles from Peshawar. Okay. And that was a bad location. True. Yeah. But um, the airfield was secure. Everything was secure around it. and. You know, don't worry. Why wouldn't this be secure? <laughs> yeah. And um, we got there. No events. I said, you see, I'm telling myself, I, I worried about nothing. I'm like a, I'm like a silly little weenie ass, you know, worried about stuff. For even thinking of it, yeah. For even worrying it about it. It hasn't happened. God. I'm glad nobody was with me that could tell them that I was worried about, you know, it's like, man, I'm, I don't have right, to admit right. that to anybody ever again. So, um, and they have what is, it's not a yellow school bus. Okay. It is a bus uh, that I think was a school bus, but it's, it's white. It's a white bus. It's very easy to see. Is my <laughs> and all the prisoners were in that bus. And another vehicle, um, I don't know exactly what it was. It wasn't a, an APC or anything like that. It, it wasn't a tactical vehicle, but another vehicle and, and our vehicle. And we were going back, you know, 20 minutes to get to the damn air, uh, oh, maybe 30 minutes, okay, to get back to the airfield. Yeah. Simple. Then all hell broke loose. Uh, the sniper must have been pretty good because he got the driver of the uh, bus. Like, I, I think it was the first shot. Now, I didn't see that. I, I, I mean, arguably, I put that together after, you know, after I talked to people and after we got through the incident. But there was this other lead vehicle, um, the bus, and then we were behind. We were number three arguably, you know, the safest position, that's okay. I'm 
weenie. I was in the safest position, but everybody else was Pakistani right, right. or or a prisoner. Um, okay. Now it's the only American. So the bus then, it, you know, and it, and it hits some kind of bump or something, and boom, it falls over. And we go, holy sh! And then we hear a lot more shots. And I go, God, I'm not going to start shooting at someone with a pistol that has a rifle. Right. I mean, I'll, I'll wait. I'll, You're just giving away your I'll position at that point. Yeah. A little bit more of the situation, but I'm not just going to start shooting my pistol. I mean, it's, sure, sure. it's just not going to happen with me. I, I'd rather wait, right. try to figure out what I'm up against a little bit. Or maybe there's a little running yeah. involved or a little uh, more hiding or whatever. I will use the pistol. I don't, right. mind, I don't mind you doing that. But so uh, the good thing is this guy had two AK-47s in the vehicle we were with. Nice. I said, can I use it? Yep. I go, okay. I never imagined myself. Am I actually going to fire an AK-47 in actual... <laughs> Uh, combat. Never, never thought I would actually do that. I mean, it just yeah. never crossed my mind. Um, and I didn't know where the snipers. I, I had no idea where they were coming from. I, I know they were, you know, like north of our position, but and not behind us. Everything was, you know, kind of up front. But I, I, right. I couldn't tell. I had no idea. So uh, the the lead Pakistani, not us, I didn't have a radio. The lead Pakistani had called for support. And two Pakistani helicopters would come. Uh, they would shoot at some stuff. I have no idea if they were effective or not. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I, I have no clue. I, I never talked to them, <laughs> never coordinated anything. And I just said, how in the hell are we going to get these guys to that airplane? I said, I'm not going to use helicopters because I can't even talk to them. It's a different language. I don't even know if I can pull this off. All right. So that happens. And then some are getting out of the bus. They're starting to get out of the bus. A couple of the prisoners are actually shot. I go, oh, my God. Now, who would be shooting the prisoners to? Like, yeah, like what was the purpose of the guy yeah, in the first place? So it, to shoot. It, I really had no essay of what I, I could. I could see things, but I really had no understanding of my little battle area at that point in time. It was the weirdest thing I'd ever felt. Uh, Sounds crazy. Part of Panama was a little like that. But so there are a couple of dead prisoners, and I assumed they were dead. I just, you know, uh, we would walk over them. Uh, we would get to the front with my Pakistani colonel, uh, and we'd go. Uh, uh, we're getting another bus. What? Well, well, they're going to be. <laughs> they're going to be in the same <laughs> situation. So I said, "Okay, are you up for this? I'm up for it. Okay, lock load. We know they're up there somewhere. Let these guys sort it out. I don't have time to." The prisoners right now, we got to go take these guys out. I mean, who else is going to do it? All right. So he doesn't want to. And then I get another Pakistani that comes from the other vehicle. So now you got three of us. And we just start spraying the shit out of this. <laughs> it wasn't a ridge line. It was like a little ridge line, but, you know, kind of rocky. And, um, we don't know if we were hitting. I mean, literally, I don't know if we were hitting anything at all. Yeah, yeah. But it was suppressive enough that we weren't getting shot at. For sure. And so I started to see another bus coming. Uh, and helicopters kept flying over. And so I asked them, I said, can those helicopters put any kind of fire on that ridge? Can they put any kind of fire on that ridge line? Because if they can... can constantly put fire on that ridge line, I think we have time to transport these prisoners 
Some of them are dead, by the way. We started out with, I think, 27 or whatever and worked our way down to 18. Um, so, but we didn't do it. We, 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 we did not shoot the prisoners. Right, right. Um, Apparently they shot their own guys for some reason. I mean, it was and, weird. And so we were doing this transload, and then I actually saw people. I actually felt more comfortable for the first time. Tell the other guy, I said, we can get those guys. We got them. Let them get closer. They're, they're, I, you know, I don't know why they didn't have a great, they, they obviously had a great sniper position. Why would they move? I don't know why they would move. Are there different people? I have no idea, but there wasn't a lot of gunfire, but there was enough to keep everybody's head down. Like four or five shots every minute kind of thing. Okay. But it wasn't intense except that little act that we pulled to just shoot the shit out of rocks that we had no idea if people were there or not. I mean, we didn't. Right, right. Right. And two get closer, and I popped them. And because I was the only one <laughs> wanting to shoot up there. But I saw them close enough, and I got now. I'm not saying I individually tapped them, I sprayed them, and I know I got because they went down. And there was no shooting after that. None. Wow. So we get all these prisoners back in the bus. And we get back to the airfield. And I see the major. And then this uh, one star, general, comes out. I go, sir, I'll have to give it to you in a debrief. Um, can I get these prisoners to Bagram, like right now? Because I got General, the Dermot 4 is wanting to know what the heck goes on. So I'll give you a debrief later. Yeah. And it's okay. So we get back to Bagram. And I think nothing of it. Because I go, okay, it's just over. And, you know, I, I didn't want to think about it, frankly. Yeah, yeah. So that general took my report that I gave him a couple of days later. And he put me in for a, a decoration, which I didn't ask for. I didn't want. I wanted to forget about it, frankly, because uh, yeah. I didn't think I did anything that warranted a medal. I mean, frankly, I didn't think I did. Oh, um, I do. I think I was thinking you deserve more than that. I mean, you you essentially saved everybody there. I mean, nobody, you were the only one willing to act. Well, I mean, know, I had buddies kind of took charge of that, the whole situation. That, that shot along with me. And to this day, I don't know oh, okay. how many enemy per se there were. I, I don't know. I know at least two oh. of them are dead. I know that. Yeah. That, because I saw that and I witnessed that. So I don't know, but uh, I didn't even tell my staff uh, you know, because I go, I was violating my rule never to be without anybody in my, you know, yeah. walk, you know, um, now I'm happy. It's just like, uh, 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 I'm, uh, blessed with, you know, that, that general didn't have to do that. Uh, nobody there had to support. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, nobody had to, nobody had to do any of that. Yeah. You know, I mean, and we didn't plan any of it. Um, so, um, that's, well, I think that's amazing. Yeah. I would argue the closest I've come though, to being killed is when I worked at the white house. Oh, really? If you remember in the, during the Clinton administration, there's a wacko kid from either New Mexico or Colorado went to the, the media side of the West wing. He was out beyond the gate, and he okay. just started shooting <clears throat> at the White House. I was walking from the West Wing to the press briefing area because I'd just given a tour of my children's godfather and godmother. You know, they knew I was. Okay. So it was like a Saturday. And... Um, I just, because I'm not in the West Wing. My office was the old executive office building. You could do that private kind of thing back then. You could actually do it now. You, you, you can't do these private 
Sure, sure. Walk around the White House thing. The security's a little tight. So I, I, had, I had finished and I was literally from the wet. If if you look at the White House, you know, there's the, the port, port of call columns stuff. And then over here is the West Wing. And there's an entrance through the West Wing. And when people, like when the speaker or somebody comes out and they're interviewing someone who had gone into the White House, you always see the door of the West Wing have that yeah. vantage point because you know there's a little okay there's a little driveway that you know it, it's, it's where they do everything well i was walking from that to the press briefing room which is right there and i actually i heard what i thought was you know i thought it was kind of like firecracker because i didn't expect to be hearing the gunshot sure yeah. but i knew after it was Okay, all right, that's you know, and I look at the concrete, you know, there are windows and, the, and there's this white plaster concrete stuff, yeah, yeah, and like, okay, that's like two feet above my head, oh, so I go prone, I just fall down, I go, you know. I'm not a Secret Service guy, so I'm just going to let them do whatever they're going to do. And right. I don't really want to participate. You know? <laughs> and, anyway, exactly. she, and I had no idea where it was really coming from. Now that I understand, yeah. well, it had to be coming from, you know, beyond the gate. So once again. Uh, You've been in all these deployments, all these hairy situations by yourself, and then you almost got capped at the White House. That's crazy. Yeah. So. That's amazing. Whatever happened with that kid? Did they, did they catch yeah, him? Yeah, I think or? they've, uh, he was tried and convicted and is spending oh, okay. the rest of his days. I forgot what his name was. It's like, um, unfortunately, it's like a Hispanic name. I can't remember what it was. Which uh, reminds me of how difficult it is to be a police officer every day in this country. You know, you from eating a sure. donut in the coffee shop till you walk out and someone takes a pot shot at you. Right. I mean, there are police that have to face that every single day in this country. And I have to admit, there's not a time that I've been shot at that I wasn't uh, scared. You know, you don't really sure. think about it a lot, but I go, yeah, I'm, and it takes time to process it afterwards. A bit. Right. Um, and in Panama, I'm glad that I didn't respond, you know, because a kid comes out of the jungle and we just jumped in and the, we jumped in with this uh, Gentex helmets. And mm -hmm. so back in the day, you know, we didn't have all our special listening devices. We had normal headphones. And so you would take your Gentex helmet off and then have some other kind of helmet on. So, but when your Gentex helmet on, you didn't get a lot of ambient uh, noise that you need, especially right. when you're walking through the uh, jungle. And uh, a kid, he was a kid. And I was locked, loaded. You know, I just jumped on an airplane in the middle of a jungle. Um, and out of nothing but sheer fear i was this close from um just blasting you know because he i hesitated of course that could have been a bad hesitation i mean it could have been could have been bad for me but he was a kid he probably was like 11 or 12. yeah uh and if i would have done that and be something else i could feel bad about for the rest of my life because that that's a horrible thing. Um, I mean, was he armed or anything, or was it just yeah, a no, kid? That, yeah, see, no I, think, arms whatsoever. I think that's just you being. I think that's you being trained. You know, I mean, that's that's what we get trained to do is to to identify a threat or a non-threat. And you know, I think you, yeah, even though you're in that heightened situation, I mean, yeah, I think you made the right decision for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm glad I, uh, I I didn't, but I was hyped. I was I was ready. I was ready and yeah. in that fearful kind of uh, stage. 
So. But you were also professional. Yeah, and but the, range, the Rangers were right very to professional too. If you, you know, I remember the way that they would about the the firing sequence would work. It was kind of unique. You'd hear, you'd hear some kind of fire from the enemy, mm -hmm. and then you'd hear a brup, 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 almost like they would triangulate exactly where it was, and then a law's rocket and. And then silence. <laughs> like, I mean, that sequence played out at, at least a dozen times. And that all came from yeah, Ranger yeah. fire. I mean, the, those were Rangers doing that. And so they were, they were reacting. Yeah, yeah. They were responding um, and, and, and somehow targeting where they had seen, you know, some incoming. And um, sure. did it with a degree of professionalism that is uh, superior. That, that I think definitely, um, but they were all Rangers that did that. Uh, so I became a fan of Rangers always. But after that, you know, Rangers were the uh, uh, for me in oh, terms yeah. of Grand Canyon. Yeah, me too. Yeah, they're they're the best. They're the best. Uh, I I enjoyed my time there a great deal, and they were just I was in awe every time I went out with those guys. You know, the most professionals and. And you want to talk about lethality? I mean, they're just—that's their—that's their forte is is taking it to the enemy for sure. So, um, uh, thank you for what you're doing, and um, keep up um, doing great work because I think you're you're an important voice for um, for our younger generations that are going to see enough uh, combat to last them, and it's always Amazing to me. I've had so many different common controllers or tag P when they're young tell me, well, sir, I'm ready to go. I want to go right now. I want to go. I mean, when I took over the 18th A side, I had two tag P who came in. So, sir, can, can you make me into a combat controller? I want to be, I want to be in CCT because I said, well, why do you want to be a combat controller? Because, because they see action. And I go, well, so now be careful what you ask for because yeah. all of these battlefield airmen at some point in time will see action. Now, this was before 9-11, so I didn't want my getting to the 18th A side to then make all the tack P's want to, I go, ah, you know, I, so I said, what I need you to be is a great tack P. That's what I need you to be. And I said, um, Unfortunately, the combat will come, and uh, somehow I've sequenced throughout my career to be at the staff when we're at peace, and to be at a unit when we're in combat. So um, I'm not predicting anything, but be careful what you. <laughs> but you know, it's um, I don't like um, I don't like it when people make distinctions among all my heroes. Um, because to some extent, they're distinctions without difference, and you're making a difference without distinction. And I go, yeah. um, there is different level of heroism. That's true. We make the Medal of Honor is different from the Air Force Cross, is different from the Silver Star, is different from the Bronze Star with Valor or the DFC. That's true. I understand that as a commander. I'm very well aware of the distinctive difference that we make there. Um, and that's why I hate to say a lesser award this or a lesser award that. I go, oh, my God, stop saying that. <laughs> stop. Drives me insane. Um, yeah. Drives me literally insane. Um, and I go to do what our special warfare airmen have done is just so undescribable that I, I, I literally, I'm, I'm just not capable of reflecting exactly what these people are. Yeah. And they're all heroes. Now, some have proven that heroism in combat. And so we do make a distinction between them. 
Uh, you don't want to steal the valor associated with any combat action. And that's what I say. I say my career is based on great NCOs doing great things in peacetime and heroic things in combat. Those I things really propelled it. me individually. I benefited from all that. I mean, I, you're looking at a guy who probably should have never made, you know, lieutenant colonel. Probably. I mean, I, you can't explain it any other way. And, yeah. and that's the truth. You know, and I don't have anything to hide or, or you know, I'm not running for office. I'm not, you know, I don't have anything to politic. I don't have anything. I am going to finish a book, though, probably in the next three or four months. And I'm going to talk yeah. about this one cool. thing. And I'd be interested in your audience giving me feedback. I think we've done a good job of documenting individual heroism. I really do. I think we've done a pretty good job of that. Because so many of our great special warfare airmen are appropriately decorated with combat accolades. Um, sure. <clears throat> and their individual stories are for the record because you can look up these decorations. You can find these things very easily. And individually, if they want to write a book saying, hey, there I was, I'll buy everybody's book who writes that. You know, sure. any one of those special <laughs> if they write a book, I'm going to buy it and read it. Okay, I, that's number one. Right. So I want them to, and I want to encourage them to do that. But what I think I haven't done as a deficiency, I didn't talk about all of them collectively. I can talk a lot about individuals because I mean I'm I can once I get on a roll I can get on a individual story you know let me tell you about Tim Stamey you know let me tell you about Donald, let me tell you yeah, about yeah. and I can start getting into it uh, I wasn't there with them but I had to kind of study what they did you know to support right. to support them in the right way so what I didn't do is say collectively this is what the 18th ASOG did. This is what the 484th did. This is what the 9th AEG and the 18th, you know, because we we do a lot of multiple command uh, things that we created. And collectively, now probably the 18th ASOG, in my mind, should have received a presidential unit citation. I had squadrons that received a presidential unit citation, and as a as the group commander, I didn't want to like steal that thunder because the army uh, had put them, you know, and they were attached to either the third ID or the Rangers or or whatever. And once again, I didn't want to mm -hmm. steal that valor because I wanted the action of the 15th ASOS and the third ID. I wanted that reflected in and kind of of itself, if you know. I, I wanted people to to talk about that in its own way. Um, yeah. But when I talked to a news reporter, I told him, I had airmen on every inch of this battlefield, both in Afghanistan yeah. and Iraq. Yeah. The whole enchiladas. And they go, you did? I go, yeah, it's not about me. So one last story. It's, because I know you got to go and we'll watch the Super Bowl after this. But <laughs> no, well, a news no, reporter, a news reporter um, gets assigned to the 15th ASOS uh, as we approach. And this is uh, the uh, battle for Iraq. You know, so third ID is in Kuwait. They're about to launch, you know, the Marines uh, on, on the right, the third ID on the left. And they're about to launch towards Baghdad. And uh, Byron Reisner, the commander, one of those hero, angel, everything, great commanders, um, he says, hey, sir, guess what? What? He says, we just got assigned embedded reporters. I went, oh, sh I mean, I actually did. And I, I said that to him. Before. He says, sir, no. He says, sir, ah, that's the bad news. He says, I got good news for you, though. I go. Oh, okay. What's the good news? He says they're from the Houston Chronicle and the San Antonio News Express. You're a Texan. 
you're from Houston. That's great news, isn't it? I go, no. What's what's great about that? The fact that I'm from Houston? You give a shit. Like, okay. Like, uh, I don't need to worry about embedded reporters. It's just not. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, he says, well, he says, you're really going to be excited of how we found out. I said, okay, how did we find out? <laughs> and Byron's great at telling these stories. Matter of fact, they're going to, 15th Day yeah. Sauce is going to have a reunion, I think, in a month or so or whatever at Moody. Oh, I hope cool. a lot of people go, uh, you know, so they're going to do that. Uh, Byron's great at this. So he says, well, he says, the quote from the San Antonio News Express guy was, what? I don't want to be assigned to some air support, weenie, back of the line, rear echelon, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> And I didn't say anything for a while, and Byron got worried. He said, sir, did you hear me? <laughs> yes, I'm trying to be, not lose my mind right now. Um, and I said, okay, tell him this, or he can talk to me. <sighs> I've had enough battalion commanders that I loved, battalion commanders that I didn't. I've told them all, you know, I love you guys. You guys, you're not going to get from Shinola. Stop talking about my TACP. Stop talking about my ALOs. You know, I mean, you heard both sides of that story. I said, what I'm not going to do yeah. is now take it from a news rep an embedded news reporter that doesn't know what we do and is assuming something because of the term air support. Right, right. You know, oh, you're support. <laughs> you're, you're whatever. Uh, okay. <laughs> I said, you can tell him this, or I'll tell him. Tell him if he comes with us, and I don't know if I should let it happen, but if he does, you can strap his ass on the front of the Hummer, okay? I'll even give him a weapon, okay, and a laptop computer, and he will be the first to know if we're rear echelon or not. Tell him I said that. Byron <laughs> says, okay, do you mind if I clean it up a little bit with a lot of expletives that I use? Yeah, sure. So anyway, <laughs> so this guy comes. His eyes are wide open. Yeah. It changed his life forever. He now has battle buddies, which I understand, because, you know, it doesn't matter what service. Yeah. You're, you, if you get a battle buddy, they could be civilian, Air Force, Navy, Marine. It, it, once you get in, in a battle with a buddy, you, you, you're battle buddies forever. That doesn't go away. That's right. And he wrote, he wrote some fantastic articles on Ford Air Controllers, TACP in this war. You know, he he nice. he did. He he wrote the Mike Shropshire um, story. The uh, yeah, I mean, he, I, and I I read them and I go, oh man, I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it all, I love it all. He was there. He's telling it like it was. And that's the kind of truth that I like to hear. You know, I will listen to that all day long and support him all day long. Okay. Yep. And so we would have an opportunity to meet in Baghdad. I said, I'll meet you in Baghdad after we strap your ass to the home. <laughs> okay. No. no, 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 no <laughs> I will meet you in Baghdad. Okay. Um, and so I did. We went to the. I'll fall, but the, the, we were in the palace and uh, mm -hmm. third ID. We were kind of, yeah, I think we did it with water and uh, tea or something. I don't know. You were 
we were uh, toasting, you know, and people uh-huh. were smoking cigars. Um, and I had the occasion to meet the reporter. So, oh, yeah, yeah, Michael and Gloria, how are you doing? You know, and he goes, um, I just got to tell you, everything that you said was uh, be careful what you ask for because, uh, you know, we were at an objective peach and, you know, the sun, the, the bombs dropping. And he just started explaining. And I go, now he was there. So I always let someone who was in tell their thing. I don't interrupt him. I just sure. let him go. Um, so I go, was your mission to write about these great American heroes? Was it successful? He goes, man, everybody loved it back at the San Antonio News Express. And they said, man, this is the best wartime correspondent reporting, you know, since, you know, the, what's his name guy with the, we were soldiers once and young. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't remember the guy's name, but I hear you talking about um, it. Yeah. I said, okay, well, now you know. Now you know what we do. And so when you hear air support, operation squad, will you be thinking rear echelon or you will be thinking up here? Which one? Oh, yeah. I love you, man. And he goes, I said, well, okay. Well, I'm happy for you and I hope you get back home. I said, oh, by the way, so you write for San Antonio? I said, yeah. I said, well, you know, and, and I'm a Texan, so. Uh, I forgive you of all your past sins. And uh, <laughs> um, he goes, well, I'm, I, I really am not from San Antonio. I'm from Houston. I went, oh. I said, oh, that's funny. I'm from Houston. He goes, oh, okay. He said, you're from Houston? I go, yeah. He says, well, what high school did you go to? I went, Lamar High School. He went, well, I went to Lamar High School. Mirabu B. Lamar High School on West Timer Road. Yes, that's where I went to school. I went, well, we could be the same. Um, what was your name again? You know, like, what was your name? Uh, <laughs> Sig Christensen. I go, Sig Christensen. I don't, I don't remember any Christensen. Well, you wouldn't have known me because I, I played football. And I, I said, I wouldn't have known you because you <laughs> played football for Lamar High School. What years did you play football for Lamar High School? <laughs> so now I'm <laughs> curious because I played football for Lamar High School. So he says, well, from 72 through 75. And I go, well, I played football for Lamar High School from 72 to 74. He goes, and he looks at my name. <laughs> no way. And he goes, Come on. He goes, Longoria. He goes, I don't. Uh, he says, you know, I don't remember you, but I think we had a quarterback who was like all state quarterback that his last name was Longoria. <laughs> yeah. He's like, yeah. I went, <laughs> Come on, dude. I went. I don't know, probably an asshole. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I go, of course. I, he couldn't put it together. I give him a break because I go, he just came out of an intense, intense. I mean, just right. a day prior, he was at Objective Peach. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, and I said, well, yeah, I was the quarterback for Lamar High School. And I said, I'm sorry, though. I still don't remember. <laughs> don't remember. <laughs> I said, "Well, I was I was really on the junior varsity." I said, "Oh, okay, that's 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 all right." Uh, I mean, because I didn't I was on varsity, I didn't I didn't know the, the sure, junior. Sure. And it's not that I was uh, special or anything like that. It's just that they were younger. I I, I didn't know, I didn't know. Yeah, of course. Uh, it's just funny how even even through all that, like he didn't put it together that <laughs> you're the, you're the same. But guy. today, today. <laughs> Now, he and I are, are, are kind of close because he always calls me and he always puts stuff in oh, that cool. are good. I said, if you write good things about my tech team, I, you, you can ask me for a quote anytime. 
He wrote some nice. great pieces on uh, Del Toro. Oh, no, okay. And I was very uh, happy with that, very proud of him for writing that. Uh, and he wrote some great things on our folks. So I invited him to the TACP Association dinner. Uh, and I asked permission from Tom Case. And I said, can I have permission to make him an honorary TACP Association life member, whatever? Uh, yeah, yeah. And Tom Case is a great guy, you know. And, and he says, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I said, uh, as long as you keep writing good things about his guy. Right, uh, but right. it, <laughs> what, what he didn't know, even though he knew all of this stuff about the third ID, he thought that that was the war. In other words, there was no other Iraq war except for the third ID. Oh, okay. Because he didn't see the other pieces and parts. And sure. I said, I had him in the north and the south, the east, the west, in the middle, in the side, on the right, you know, left, right, like soft, Everywhere. conventional, otherwise, you know, marine liaison. I mean, uh, the entire uh, battlefield. I said, please write about all these great Americans, too, because they're just as decorated as my. 15 day sauces, if not more, you know, the, uh, you know I said, right, right. it literally does not stop with these guys. They were everywhere. And that's why yeah. we won. So, and he, he's, he's, he's a convert. If you know, I mean, he became a convert, you know, way back when. Now he's a convert sure, to sure. TAC P writ large. Uh, and he's in San Antonio. So it's a good, well, I hope, uh, uh, I hope I've given you a little stuff. Um, oh, sir, this is this has been great. I mean, like I, said, I could listen to you all night. Um, and you always say you always question why, how you even made it past major. It, there's no question in my mind how you made it. I mean, just your 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 attitude and your your um, just your ability to see through the garbage and and do the right thing and just your drive. I mean, that, it's it's just obvious how you made it to where you did. And I can't thank you enough for everything you've done for the career field and. For all the guys, I mean, I really do appreciate everything you've done. So, and, and thanks for coming on here. You bet. I can't thank Tell you. I love them all. all right. We'll do. We'll do. And good luck to you. And keep doing what you're doing. We'll do, sir. Right. Thank you. Thank appreciate you. it. All right.